Uh, my name is Mark Cohen. I've been working with BFA for about five years. I've got a uh, started a chapter in, in Ohio. I live in south, southeastern Ohio. Um, I've been recently working in, as an inter-chapter kind of connector person. It's been quite interesting. Um, I really appreciate being in this, this conference and in this crowd because um, the orientation is, is really right on the money in terms of the soil. The soil is really central to, to what we need to restore from pretty much from bottom to top. If you look at uh, you know, the, the nested systems of uh, you know, cell to organ to organism to ecosystem or community and then watershed, bioregion, biosphere, we really need to be kind of look, be looking up and down that system as we're solving for um, doing the restoration that we need to do. And <clears throat> so what I'm mostly going to be talking about is um, restoring landscapes and ecosystems, but it's also involved in transitioning from fossil fuels to a regenerative economy. And so the, regenerative, the, the real backbone of a regenerative economy is going to be landscape uh, over and over again, but there's technology involved and I'm going to be sharing some uh, what I think is very exciting <laughs> breakthrough technology. Um, uh, carbon negative renewable energy. And we'll probably do that in the second uh, piece of this. But um, I will back up just a hair and uh, talk a little bit about how, how I came to this point. So I was, uh, like a lot of children, very curious and very um, inspired in, uh, in, in the natural world and just exploring. And I was lucky enough to have two parents that um, gave me some very good skills. Uh, my mother is an artist and gave me some, some good right brain aesthetic skills and my father is a scientist and gave me some skills to kind of burrow into, to, to follow that curiosity and, and go into it uh, and um, dive in, which I did. And <clears throat> I think there's an important thing for all of us and, and also for children to follow that curiosity because it, it leads straight into a whole series of stages. Um, initially, uh, a sense of wonder, uh, which kind of uh, grows into uh, gratitude, and that kind of moves into a, a desire for reciprocity and stewardship and then uh, restoration. So as I followed that into some kind of what I consider miraculous encounters with beautiful organisms that just kind of took me into a nonverbal state and uh, opened up something that lasts for life. And I guess that's my point here, is that there's an energy that we need to do the work that we're going to be talking about that isn't really talked about, I don't, I don't think, very well. And uh, it's something that you don't go back from. Uh, and it has to do with quality. So I, I guess I got into this thinking about food quality, right? And what is what is quality and then quality for who? Is it quality just for the person who eats it? Is it quality for the um, soil microorganisms? Is it, is it quality for all the native species in that, in that habitat? And I lean toward the larger. And so there's, there's this whole psychological piece that, that, that surrounds this work that I, I'll mention before I get into it because I think it's, it's really important. Um, and it's kind of a transition to, uh, from an egocentric perspective through uh, anthropocentric and into biocentric, which is, I think, where sanity begins. <laughs> and it requires a lot of um, confidence, I think, ultimately, but um, to, to kind of let go of the control and, and the fear uh, territory that the ego uh, is held by. And I think that this sense of wonder and uh, the opening that happens, or uh, for me, it was a dissolution of that ego, uh, fully, fully, uh, fully blown apart um, previous self. Everything that I was taught of who I was was kind of taken apart in a, in a really uh, profound experience in the mountains, in, uh, in the Teton Mountains. And so that was a, a really key experience for me to, to make it into that biocentric place where you begin to start thinking of yourself <clears throat> as representing all living things, not just one body and uh, in one piece of time. And uh, I think that, that nothing short of that is required for <clears throat> what we're getting into now as we, um, 
I guess the other part is it's, it's hard to talk accurately about where we are because it's really pretty heavy. Uh, I, I wrestle with the uh, process of being optimistic. You know, I, I consider myself optimistic, but my inner struggle with it is that I, I can't allow myself to have my optimism based on denial. And I think denial is like the, the, the thing that's keeping the vast majority of people upright right now. And I used to think it was lame, but I, I see it as, as a real necessity. And it, it really kind of brings me to, what, okay, what is the experiential curriculum or the uh, community connectivity uh, that empowers people to, um, <clears throat> to have the audacity to, to just go into it, hopefully? Uh, and, and why I say that is that I, we, are, we are in pretty clearly uh, the sixth extinction spasm uh, that this planet has seen. And uh, not to dwell on that because um, the other part of what that I really need to say is that we never really, there's, there's two pieces to it. I don't know how to say it better. It, it's, 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 there's a two part thing. And the first part is pretty rough. Hold your judgment on it, uh, and that really is if we're we're really looking accurately at the at the situation. There's probably 20 or 30 uh, sets of conditions that any one of them could bring about our extinction. But <laughs> you know, it's all odds. In other words, you know, we don't really know anything for sure. I guess is the point. Uh, it's it, the odds look uh, like they're not in our favor. Let's just put it that way. But the other part of it, that I think the, the important part, is that if we were to really open our eyes and look at the fact that we're alive on this amazing planet, and that we, um, when you look out at, at the sky at night and look at how rare that is and how miraculous every moment of our life has been, uh, we've been beating those same odds all the way along. So we should expect miracles, because really that's all we've ever seen if we look at it that way. So, I'll say that going, going into the territory uh, that we're going into because uh, part of what, what I'm talking about here is this transition from fossil fuel addiction and uh, it really is a blinding subsidy in our life. It's very hard to see beyond it. And um, if you've ever been to a mountaintop removal site or a tar sands site or a fracking uh, site, uh, you would have all of the moral ethical reasons to transition as fast as possible, even if it wasn't for the fact that um, it's, it's wreaking havoc on our uh, ability to grow food outdoors, uh, all, all kinds of existential is issues. We shouldn't need it to be an exist existential issue to have a uh, desire to transition to something better. And there's plenty that's better. Uh, and that's, I guess that's my point. Um, so, where I went with it was uh, right out of high school. I went after that experience into uh, a program on wildlife biology. And I began looking at uh, the needs of different animals in the habitat, and the whole concept of habitat, and that every living thing has one. And the revelation for me was that habitat is not, uh, it's not fixed in terms of what, how many, uh, individuals or species or totality of species, it'll support. There's a, a concept called carrying capacity. And that was really amazing to me. It was like, okay, this is what we're for. You know, we've clearly been reducing the carrying capacity across the board in almost every habitat, unless you're looking at, you know, parasites and pathogens and, and so forth. But uh, we haven't been really doing what I think we desire if we were to really sit down and think about the footprint we want to have in the world, especially in a a conference like this. So what I, what I started to find was, that, okay, okay, we can do this in the landscape and, and we'll double the population of this animal and they'll be much healthier and it'll be you know, very good for them. Then we start getting bigger and bigger composites of these animals in the habitats and we bring them all up. Uh, you know, and so soil building really like lifts all boats, um, for example. But, I went through that program and I got to the point where I asked this question and it became like a, an esoteric question in academia, at least at that time. And that is, what is human habitat? What is good human habitat that uh, repeatedly will give you positive physical and mental results over and over again? There was no program to study that. So I, I put together a combination of anthropology and botany and philosophy and, and just dove into it on my own. 
And that led me to a point of wondering where to put my shoulder to the wheel in this time of fairly extreme conditions. Uh, I, I really had this desire to see a, um, a highly functional ecosystem, basically something that would have been like going back in a time machine in North America 600 years or so, uh, particularly with the cultural interface, human cultural interface embedded in it. And that, I found myself going to Central America. And um, at this point, I was already living on a farm in Southern Ohio. Uh, we'll talk about the cooperative nature of the human part of this. Uh, so I, we did an experimental project of uh, which I still live at and with, uh, which is a community land trust. It's a cooperatively owned uh, piece of property that is a huge leverage point, especially, I mean, it's much more relevant now than it was when I was in my 20s because young people have a very difficult time accessing land. Land tenure is, is getting harder and harder, it's more expensive, plus it doesn't make sense to try to do everything on your own anyway. You know, there's a lot of that property, the, the woods and the ponds and the roads and the, some, even some of the equipment, uh, all that is really a good thing to share the expenses on. Otherwise you have debt that just kind of balloons out, you're paying all this interest. So a big part of the work that we're gonna be looking at is, uh, requires freedom. And so there's this whole uh, relationship of freedom and debt, um, which gets us to economics, which I think the, uh, the important piece that I want to say about economics is uh, there's this uh, ability that we need to develop to be able to discern the difference between principle and interest in the biological account. So where I'm going to be heading is kind of this fairly simplistic list of, of what I c would call natural capital. Um, you know, it's the soil, it's the water, it's the genetic and cultural diversity, um, the biomass, and, um, and really air, atmosphere, I mean, it gets into the balance of our, of our atmosphere. And so embedded in that is, is, is a lot more. But if we were to have based our currency on that, for example. See, our currency is fully divorced of it. Those are all what they call externalities. We can fully erode and poison the whole... You mean currency? You mean real economic Actual currency, currency yes. So not gold-based, but... No, I'm saying much more important than gold. Uh, well, uh, so that concept. Uh, yeah. Okay. How we do it, not easy, but I'm just saying that it, if we could imagine that, that, you know, if our soils were uh, you know, 20 percent eroded and our currency was devalued because of that, or we were losing species and it would, or the other way around, we would be motivated to build that natural capital up and it would raise all boats. So this is where I think we, we have, uh, by the time I was 17 I realized this was a mental health epidemic. And I, I also realized, <laughs> well, no, the, the, the society that I lived in, and, and what was I going to do about it? Yeah, but it also, it wasn't necessarily the way to talk about it, because it's not very diplomatic. However, it doesn't change the fact. You know. uh, so that took me to reference points. You know, the real need to determine uh, functional, healthy reference points uh, for ecosystems, for cultures, for mental health. Uh, not just to be better than something that's deeply broken, not just looking at abnormal psychology and saying, I'm, you know, I'm not that bad, so I'm okay. I'm, I'm talking about something that you, you hold up and you work for the rest of your life to get there. Uh, and so that's where these reference ecosystems and reference cultures. And so I started looking at what I would call old growth cultures versus, you know, adolescent. And we can t talk about what some of those are. Um, in order to get through the time frame here, although we can roll into the second piece, which is nice because last year I ran out of time, um, I think we'll jump into this a little bit. So I think I'm going to start with, uh, so uh, the, the, the reference ecosystems um, are, are really key, um, and we'll return to that in a bit. I guess what I want to say about a, a lot of the work that's really critical right now is, is translocating carbon from the atmosphere to the soil, landscape, and the populations of 
animals, plants, pollinators, you know, all the different uh, ecological relationships that were once here. I mean, when Europeans arrived, it was an astounding situation in North America. And almost across the board, it's been reduced. Now, eastern U.S. is kind of an interesting case in terms of the forest. It was fully de defoliated um, maybe 120 years ago. Uh, and it's really come back nicely. But that's partly come back because we went from making charcoal, which I'm going to talk about charcoal. Ironically, it's, it's actually one of our strongest leverage points. But they got it really wrong back then in order to make steel and uh, you know, wiped out the forest of the, the eastern US. But the reason why it's come back so well partly is that uh, of the oil, uh, the petroleum uh, discoveries and, and use. So it, it took the pressure off of cutting down trees. Anyway, um, once we find ecosystems that are really ecosystems, cultures, you know, human health, uh, because I think that human health is, is really core here too. Uh, I've been looking at the economics of it, and if you look at the rise in chronic disease, uh, the, the rate that it's rising, the cost of health care, how really it's not working, um, that some people are saying that within 20 years that virtually everyone will be either sick or caring for someone who is, and the, the medical system won't be able to handle it. It hits overload, and then it, it just sort of absorbs the whole economy. And that doesn't leave much for food and transportation and housing and energy. So the, the only way out of this really is to do prevention and to uh, get ahead of it, to, to stop it from getting you know, to the point where you're treating symptoms in the first place. And again, the soil is so key. I had these conversations about 10 years ago with Jerry Brunetti, which really kind of led me to this organization and to meeting Dan Kittredge. And uh, that was where I became fully convinced that there was no uh, alternative than to uh, get way into soils. And uh, uh, so that's kind of why I'm here um, at this conference anyway. So I guess what I want to say about carbon uh, is translocating this carbon is that it isn't just this problem in the atmosphere. It is what the spirit wears. There's an anthropologist, uh, Wade Davis, uh, once said that um, the spirit rides the horse of matter. And so uh, I guess we can just jump right into this. So these beings that we share the planet with are, um, you know, we're all at risk here in a big way. And I think that we need to really think about the gravity of it. And uh, in the work that we're doing, it's not just to, to grow good food for ourselves and our families and people we care about. It's, this is all interconnected. Um, and it's, it's really inspiring to get in touch with these beings and have face-to-face -face encounters, like I mentioned before, really changes you. As a little kid, I pulled a a rainbow or a, a brook trout out of the water and looked at it and just like again that speechless moment or um, another time when I was 10 years old I was coming home with my uh, parents and we were coming down this long row of oak trees coming home and I had a, uh, a tree house in the backyard and as I was coming down it was at night headlights are on it and I see this big white head pop out of the tree house and this snowy owl dives out and just flaps two or three times and was out over the lake. And it's just like, you know, those things change you. And so anyway, I won't spend too much time on that. But uh, these are, I mean, the Great Barrier Reef, 90% gone. It's, it's almost uh, uh, going to be a memory that uh, we'll have to tell stories to children about. Um, you know, it's, so you get the point. Uh, so somewhere around. Um, the mid-1980s, I decided to go to Central America. Uh, I was interested in antiquities and um, cultures who lived directly from these uh, landscapes and ecosystems, um, and I needed to see it. So I went, I went down for a few years, began working with people in the bush with machetes uh, off the roads, up into the jungles, and growing large fields of crops. and all manner of tropical fruits and doing it with nothing but elbow grease and, um, and being surrounded by incredible creatures. And it, it really blew my mind. I immediately quit college 
um, because I what I what I was learning, you know, in the first day was things I would I couldn't hope for, and no matter how much time I spent in uh, learning off of a two-dimensional screen or a book or or whatever. And I got I love I mean I I liked the experience of learning. It's just that this you know knocked it out of the water. And uh, anyway, uh, let's see. I got up in here. In the, there's a, a mountain range in the, in southern Belize that. Um, is pretty much uninhabited, and I'm right on the edge of that is a property that uh, I ended up buying uh, and turned it into an, uh, an agroforestry research center, a botanical garden, an ethnobotanical garden, and um, <clears throat> the way into it is, is by dugout canoe. And I began bringing students down. Instead of resenting what I didn't learn in school, I decided to create that experience for others, and um, it was a very interesting uh, Time I spent 25 winters, uh, about four months a year, when I wasn't farming in Ohio, um, down there, and um, I got to what I was after pretty much that I, I don't think I could have found anywhere else. But uh, the the place is just riddled with ancient cities and and temples and full of these uh, very numinous beings. And so here is a. Um, uh, or one of these reference ecosystems, and it's the furthest north point of this type of tropical forest. It goes into more scrubby uh, Yucatan uh, type forest as you go north of here, uh, but really quite astounding. So this, as a reference, gives you these tools to begin to design in parallel. You look at all the different pieces of it and you can start to replace species with, you know, fruits and chocolate and coffee and, you know, I had probably 300 species all the Mayan medicinals, as well as the, the timber trees and the, uh, all the medicines, and uh, amazing. I mean, it was all by hand. I mean, there was no roads going in, no machines. And so the point here is that I was looking for something that I could understand that was unsubsidized. Up here, everything I knew was so buried in fossil fuel energy that you could um, burn 20 calories to produce one and go away thinking you had an economic success. Uh, just, and, and, and while you're doing that, you're losing your soil and your genetic diversity and, and so on and so forth. So I just needed to peel back the onion back down to just what I could observe and what I could physically do. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a real education. So the farm uh, has 13 temples on it, hilltops that had chocolate planted 100 years ago, cacao. Uh, and lots of other, uh, mostly native crops at that point. So I was interplanting things into it. The farm is inhabited by five species of wild cats, including jaguars and uh, all kinds of other, uh, I'm, I do a lot of work with birds and use them kind of like um, canaries in the mine shaft in reverse. You know, so I'm seeing birds coming in that nobody, even the 100-year-old people in the village had never heard the bird calls of. And so uh, that, that's a real affirmation of the, uh, of the landscaping that you're doing because you're building that habitat and uh, you're watching for the positive signs, not just watching them all disappear like we do up here for the most part. Uh, anyway, there's, there's zillions of examples of symbiotic relationships. This is an acacia species that has an ant um, uh, that lives in the hollow thorns. Uh, there's these little, it's not a good photo, but there's a hole right there. They live inside of there. And then the plant has these extra floral nectaries that feed the ants, this sugar water type thing. And these little kind of, I think they're called belchian bodies on the edges of the leaves. Anyway, this plant doesn't have any uh, chemical protection, so it has that relationship that they've developed in a mutualism. And so these, these mutualisms are important for us because I think it's a reference point for symbiosis that we can have these bi-directional flows, a lot like a healthy plant uh, that you know, gets to the point where it has all of its minerals and biology and then it can afford to give back 50 to 60% of, of the photosynthetic energy to the microbes and fungi in the soil and then the soil can give it back and you just get, literally get this whole pump uh, going. Um, again, the bird diversity. We did some bird banding to look at the return migrant birds and using these habitats and um, so forth. We don't have time to go into that too much. This was a crazy bird, a royal flycatcher that only does this either under, while it's in, in mating or uh, under duress. And um, shit. <laughs> Sorry, I'm 
not a tech, tech knucklehead. Okay, so um, yeah, lots of different types of two, uh, three different types of toucans. This is an ancient cacao that I found about 20 miles back in the jungle that was one of the rarer types. There's three different types of, of, of chocolate. This was one of the original that the Mayans were growing 1,200 years ago. Uh, just lots of germplasm to collect. Another toucan. Not a good picture, but this is looking south toward Honduras uh, from the top of one of our hills. And you can see on the Indian uh, land uh, the kind of these waffle hills that are pretty fertile compared to the mountains behind. And, um, and the, uh, everybody farms uh, out there. They have a system of cooperative land use. Uh, what's interesting is that they don't really, or when I first got there anyway, um, didn't exchange a lot of money. They could get around this money economy largely by when they had to thatch their house or plant a bean field or a rice field or harvest something, they would get 20 people from the village to come and help them for that day. And then they would pay each of those people back a day of labor. So this, th these are going to get into things that I think have to do with that freedom and getting away from debt. Um, it, it's kind of hard to see, but this is kind of, I believe this is coming. I think we're, we are going to be running out of the, the ability to burn 20 calories to, to, to make one. Uh, the amount of waste that's, in our, that's surrounding us is just off the charts. Uh, when, you do, when you actually take the time to look at what's involved in it, um, it's, it's an amount of waste that's... Um, that can't go on, and, and it's destructive again. So from a moral, ethical perspective, we would want to get that, get rid of it. I mean, waste is what? Uh, it's it's uh, incomplete design. Somebody didn't do their design job uh, well. Um, so what I developed was a, and this gets kind of interesting in this analog approach, what you find is most biological life is at interfaces. Uh, where interfacing uh, of, of a forest with a, with a field, with a, some water, different you know, habitat types coming together is where you get this balloon of, of life. So what I was doing was develop 20 of these plots, uh, maybe an acre and a half, a, acre, acre and a half, and this is a cornfield that we planted, uh, again all by hand. And then I'm taking it from another hill, which was planted the previous year in rice or beans or squash or something. Uh, there's papayas and bananas and plantains in, so this, in the second year. By the third year, it'll kind of be phasing into a fallow for 17 more years. So there'll be 20 of these plots around a permanent forested system, agroforestry with uh, probably 150 species of hardwoods and cacao and coffee and ginger, turmeric, vanilla, uh, on and on and on. Um, and so it's that interface. And so if you were to go up in a hot air balloon and look down, you would see this mosaic pattern with maximum amount of edge between all these different serial stages. And that's where the biodiversity can be uh, easily rival or even more in some cases in the Amazon, some, some of the Amazonian villages, uh, of if you just went into a, a deep uh, forested ecosystem, uh, there's less diversity. There may be different species in, in those deeper forest sy systems, but uh, it really kind of amazed me what could be done. I mean, for me, it was an experiment. If you just pulled off the stops, what, what were the limits? You know, what, if, you know, how much could we share with other life forms? We don't have to rationalize. You know, we've got to break some you know, eggs to make an omelet kind of thing, and the jaguars got to go because they're eating the cows, which they did. And the, um, uh, you know, there's issues with wild critters. You're going to lose some crops. We got wild pigs and quadimundi, uh, groups of quadimundi that come in, and you got to go out and hunt some meat if you want to get your crop. And that's probably the origins of agriculture was allowing the compost pile to grow and then you know, shooting things that came, came after it. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, we can really, we can apply all of these things. And what I didn't see coming, because I, I had students coming down uh, and we would go through all these curriculums in the first week, we'd connect them to everything on their plate, everything in the building, everything coming through the light bulb, where it came from on the farm. And it was kind of a revel revelation for most people to be able to trace your whole life at a, at a given moment back to a landscape and one by one go through the 10 steps to make chocolate or the, you know, the eight steps to make coffee, right? You know, from the bean in the, in the nursery bag uh, to uh, planting trees out to harvesting the berries to taking off the, the pulp to, you know, drying, uh, taking off the hull and 
winnowing it and then roasting it, grinding it, making a cup of coffee. You get a whole new appreciation. And this is a piece of the, the quality uh, story too that no gadget's gonna be able to measure. And I'll tell a real quick story that for me where it happened. Uh, I had been maybe five years into this whole homesteading thing and I was living in a little cabin in the woods and it was a, a blizzard. There was about two feet of new snow and uh, I found myself throwing a log on the fire and looking out at this the beautiful landscape outside and I pulled a quart of peaches off the shelf that I had canned and then I had planted that tree and I had watched it grow through you know, thunderstorms and rainbows and bluebirds landing on it and all the stuff was just washing through my mind as I tasted that and so for something happened when I tasted those peaches that uh, you couldn't buy. There's no amount of money. A, a billionaire couldn't buy one taste of those peaches, right? So I don't even know how to, you know, talk about that other than to tell that story. But anyway, the quality is, is a very interesting thing to lead with. And it, whether you, um, I like it because it kind of gets around the fear. You could do this from fear, you could do it from economics, you could get into these things for lots of reasons, but uh, quality is, is a great one to, to go after, especially if that quality does ex, uh, include uh, the other species that we share the planet with. So let's see, sorry. Uh, so this is a, a, after a rice field, make bush camps like maybe a mile back. These are sweet potatoes growing in the mulch of the, the winnowed rice hulls and then carrying it back in bags and then some plantains and hot peppers and other things. So it's just a living mulch uh, example. Um, so these understory situations are, are, are I'm, I'm getting involved now with, or I actually have been for a while in, um, in Ohio and in, in Pennsylvania and other, other states with uh, growing medicinal plants in an understory situation and looking at non-timber forest products and, and beginning to uh, see forests as uh, sources of uh, economics instead of just board feet of lumber. And there's a, I hope to be able to get through all this <laughs> in this talk, but there's this really kind of sweet spot where by thinning the understory, uh, you reduce the, um, the fuel load and the fire danger, and you create an environment, not just the fuel load and the fire danger, but the competition between the trees. So the nut trees bear better, the wildlife have more to eat, the, a lot of times, depend, not in this example, this is a tropical uh, a cacao, and, um, but you know, we could do this here with our forests that are starting to burn in a terrible way and, and not maybe fireproof them, especially California, but you, the, the intensity of the fire will be far less than it would have been if you left that fuel load and did this kind of Smokey the Bear fire suppression thing until you had an incredibly bad situation and, and it's going to inevitably catch fire. But you'll have more, um, you know, you'll have more, well, if you do it right, you'll be selecting the genetics of those trees, those seed trees will get better and better and better. I have a friend in the Ozarks who's been managing for about 40 years now, low grade logging, instead of going in there taking the very best trees, kind of like Elmer Fudd going in and shooting the biggest buck, taking out the, the best genetics right off the top, uh, doing this with, um, with these trees where the forest, he's got data now that after 40 years that he's got about twice as much carbon stored in that system and the genetics of the forest are very improved. Another layer in this is the, the material that you move in order to uh, remove in order to get all these, these positive results of, of you know, reducing fire danger and producing more nuts and then at a lot of these systems, this is what the Indians were doing, uh, native peoples across North America, they were doing these, these cool burns regularly and it was opening up the understory and then the, the grasses and the uh, medicinal plants and tubers were coming in between the ungulates, the deer and elk were maximized so they had their meat, they didn't need to have fences and so forth. Um, but the real sweet spot is that that material, when you take it out, you thin that forest to get that result, right? Now you're ready to plant, you know, whether it's golden seal or ginseng and mushrooms in this area or chocolate in the tropics. You take that material you've harvested and you grade it into lumber and then maybe some mushroom logs and then you take everything else and you chip it and you run it through a pyrolysis process, which we'll be looking at in the second piece today, and you can make 
uh, electricity now. For the first time, I'm working with these engineers in, uh, in Athens, Ohio, that are, it's, a, it's a, a Stirling engine that is, uh, runs off gasif gasified wood, and it leaves you with charcoal. That's, that's the magical point, really, because it's this leverage point where the carbon will last over 100 times longer than if you just threw that piece of wood and it rotted and oxidized. And, and it would have some value for that, for sure. I'm not saying it doesn't, but... Is that the same as biochar? Yes, biochar would be an agricultural use of charcoal. But there, is, uh, there, there are some variations on um, temperatures and, and things like that. Uh, we, we may have time to get into that. So. That's just some stacked corn and a baby hanging in the shade while we were working on the, uh, I think that was chili peppers being harvested. And that's, those bunches in the front of the corn are sesame. And sesame is a really nice high calcium uh, plant-based um, source of uh, calcium in the absence of dairy in, in this community. So I was growing, uh, I, I did, this is a project I had, I worked on a bit of a biointensive garden uh, and, and you can see we had to shade it with, with palm leaves um, because of the intense tropical sun. So in the tropics, this, this multi-strata agroforestry shade, which we're going to be getting into next, is absolutely essential because you'll, you'll get fried in the sun and your animals and so forth. Uh, and, and there's probably 50 species of fruit uh, going up the hill up to the lodge where we, we have the uh, classes and things. Gosh, I could spend too much time on all this, but this is a, some biological terraces where you plant leguminous trees on contours and then you cut them off periodically and weave them in like a, a living basket and they re-sprout and they keep growing so you can get bean poles or firewood or you can leave one every 10 feet and girdle it and plant a yam or a a vanilla or a chayote and it'll climb up the, the, the girdled, so you girdle the tree and it drops its leaves and it's a nitrogenous mulch for the crops you planted under it. So we've got probably 15, 20 different species. There's cassava and banana and climbing spinach and numerous other things in there. Um, this is just showing that, you know, with a machete you can pretty much derive your whole economy. This is a, a machine for probably six different species of wood with some very hard uh, Sweetia panamensis uh, heartwood in the middle for the, what you do is you get two people turning those and you put sugar cane in there to press the sugar cane to make um, syrup or, or sugar. Uh, but you make your own tools from the machete as well as pretty much everything else. This is a uh, this is a building we built and those, uh, those trees all had to be cut at the right time of the moon, pretty far into the jungle, very hard wood, sinks in the river so hard, uh, so you couldn't even get it into the boat. Um, and then the vines that hold it all together, again, right time of the moon, and you can be skeptical and do it at the wrong time and have it watch it last 18 months instead of 10 years or, or more. Um, but uh, that upper part of that, that building was pretty much ancient, uh, thousands of years old. Underneath of that, we had like a, uh, a framed second floor, and then below that we had you know, a cement um, uh, first floor, try to keep, get ahead of the uh, termites and whatnot. This is a Cahoon palm, and uh, that's one leaf, so we can do lots of different things with that, and it makes an oil, uh, pretty high quality oil, a lot like coconut there, and then you got the hull as fuel. You can make biochar out of that as well. Sky was blue as we were putting this up. We were a little concerned because it was, um, uh, we just put down a tongue and groove floor and by the time we were up about six feet from the top, the clouds rolled in and it just poured after we got the last leaf on it. Uh, we made our own dugout canoes. That's the inner rib of that same palm leaf used as a, as a shaping guide for the ads. Pulled the boat out of the jungle for about a mile and a half once we made it. You can see uh, this was back, this, these are cacao pods. Uh, anyway, I'm spending too much time. This is what uh, fermented, roasted, peeled cacao. I don't know if anybody's ever had it, but it's, uh, it's a whole different animal than any chocolate you've had. And if you grind it fresh from the grinder, it just melts to 60% 60, 60 cocoa butter. And then you make that with coconut cream and, and honey from this little sting, amazing stingless bee uh, that's like out of a Tolkien book. Um, and you... <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I did not. I wish I would. I had some, but boy, that takes all day to do. 
again, this is the coffee at that stage of taking off the inner hull, uh, then winnowing it and then roasting it. Okay, so this is back to the sobering information. I won't spend a lot of time, but um, okay. I, so this is six, seven hundred thousand years, about seven hundred thousand years of temperature and CO2 tracking. You can see where the peaks just match each other almost perfectly. The, the peaks are um, interglacial and the, the troughs are glacial cycles. Um, the interesting, if not terrifying, point is, um, so right here is the 10,000 years of our last 10,000 years of agriculture. Very, very mild temperatures, right? And so it's not like back here that these people were dummies and didn't invent agriculture. It, it basically, agriculture doesn't happen in, in this whole zone. You know, there's this mild window we've gotten really used to. Our whole agricultural food existential situation is, was on that, that little plane and was uh, t already kind of temporary. And then we went along and did this. We went off the charts for probably a good million years and this is this is where we are now, so it's anything goes as far as predicting what that actually means for us and, and particularly for our agriculture. So I realize at one point that when you, you go back and you look at what the Europeans were writing in their journals about the passenger pigeons and the large forests and the huge herds of bison and the fish in the oceans and the rivers, where did they go? You know, not, the, not only the actual animals, but their whole habitats are up there causing crazy havoc. And I guess the point that I'm getting at here is that we can look at it as, as a terrifying thing, and it is, uh, or we can also look at it as an opportunity to pull that carbon back down into our soils and, and regrow all those habitats back into carbon um, where they're supposed to be, on, on, you know, terrestrial carbon as opposed to atmospheric carbon. I guess that's all I'll say on that. Uh, so again, we don't have time to go into th too much here, but the numbers in the, in, the, in the soil are quite high when you look at what's in the atmosphere. And so there's a, there's a huge, we can get all the problematic carbon back into places where we want it and it's gonna uh, feed people and take care of animals and so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of complexity here. I'm not glossing over it, we just need to keep moving. Uh, and then again, the carbon into the soil food web is the most sensible place for it. Um, there's some, just every day it seems like there's new information uh, coming out now about um, the, uh, the soil microbiome uh, it, and the crosstalk between our gut microbiome. And so when we're eating these foods, um, you know, especially if we're getting it directly from the field and we're eating it and we're not cooking the daylights out of it, uh, we're actually building our, our gut microbiome with that food as well as all the secondary metabolites and the minerals and uh, other interesting compounds. Uh, so this is what we want to develop. This is where we want to put the carbon. And uh, it's fairly straightforward. We'll, we'll get into it. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Lal at Ohio State. Uh, I've been meeting with him a little bit here lately. He's quite a, a, quite a resource on if you're interested in carbon. Uh, um, so basically, you know, this is doable. And so this takes us to, I think, I don't know, if anybody has a better example of what humans have ever done, tell me, because this, this is the, the most amazing thing I've ever encountered. Uh, these are soils in the Amazon that are called terra preta, which are seven foot deep black super fertile soils, like up to 50% organic matter. Uh, and these are, this is what, the soils in the area look like that people didn't build. This, what, those were, those were man-made black soils. Uh, and so the, the key to it, only in the last 20 years has it been pretty, has it been pretty solidified that these are, these are anthropogenic soils. And that the, that the way that they did it, they don't know exactly how, but that it's, it's uh, biochar as, as the core of it. Um, 
So very, very interesting uh, because, I mean, I, I spent lots of years trying to build carbon in those tropical soils and you can build a big compost pile and come back eight months later and fit the whole thing in a, in a five gallon bucket. It oxidizes about as fast as you can make it. So for this to be at least 600 years since the last person did anything to generate them uh, is stunning to me. And they, they probably did it over about a 2,500 year period. So the black spots are all the places where those soils are. And it's a, you collectively, it's about the area the size of France. Um, this gives us some real big clues as to where to use, how to use this charcoal and what to do with our soils to layer it. Yeah, Jim? Just a reference that you might want to reference, Albert Bates' book. Uh, yep, there's a, there's a number of books now. There's a lot of information beginning to emerge. There's a lot of pretty poor information for a long time, and uh, it's starting to be understood. Um, but yeah, I'll have some resources on the table. I'll be setting up either tonight or tomorrow uh, the Ohio uh, BFA chapter table, and I'll have a number of things, including a, a really interesting biochar stove. Uh, we can cook also, cook our food really cleanly. This guy, Paul Anderson in, at the University of Illinois, did, there was a, a challenge to, to make the cleanest burning, most efficient biomass stove in the world, and he won that. And it's amazing. I've been using it with like corn cobs and um, what's interesting to me is, is um, bamboo. Uh, bamboo burns like rocket fuel in it, very clean, and it's super high in silica. So silica is a, a whole other soil uh, story. Getting it plant available needs some work. But uh, anyway, this is the micropore structure. Really looking at the, the xylem and the phloem that was moving through the original wood uh, is maintained. The oxygen and hydrogen is driven off in the, in the pyrolysis. And uh, as I mentioned, as I will get into about that we can actually get these things done now uh, by making electricity, which is uh, bypassing the, the coal and the, uh, you know, all the fossil fuel uses. And then the hot water, it makes continuous hot water, which is uh, you know, displacing fracking gases and, and all that, that. I mean, it's, it's huge what it represents. Plus, after you've got your electricity and your hot water and you've grown your, your greenhouse crops in the winter, um, you have the charcoal to build these black soils with. Or to gasify and run your gravely tractor or uh, you know a generator. There's, there's lots of things you can do with it. I mean, if we have time, we'll we'll go into a list of all the, the incredible things uh, that can be done. So even things like straw, you can char uh, agricultural waste, not necessarily wood. Wood is kind of interesting to me. Uh, if you don't, if you run out of you know things that are waste, you know uh, you know sawmill uh, uh, products that are laying around in big piles, chips and from the highway and all that. But uh, you can, where I'm going to go next with it is that we can plant in trees and, and shade and protect from the hot sun, which is getting hotter, um, the agricultural and pasture systems that are growing our food. We don't have to just be victims to the, the now that we're down to the, really the bottom end of the our organic matter, each percentage point of organic matter holds 28,000 gallons of water per acre. So they were probably averaging about five points in the past. Now they're down like often one or lower. So we've lost the sponge. We lost that, that soil carbon sponge that Walter Yenny uh, has been talking about lately. And I would highly recommend uh, looking at his work. Um, Okay, so I mentioned some of that. I better keep moving. Uh, I mentioned natural capital. I mean, this is interesting because it's a statement by the World Bank uh, of all places. Um, be a beginning to understand that there's more to capital than just abstract currency that uh, means nothing. Um, so this one's interesting too. We were running a business with the biosphere as our major asset, we would not allow it to depreciate. We would ensure that all necessary repairs and maintenance were carried out on a regular basis. Um, you wouldn't think that would be having to be pointed out, mm -hmm. but uh, that's where we're at. So there's a very interesting thing here uh, that happens. Um, so if you watch any piece of land get knocked back by fire, by earthquakes, by volcanoes, or whatever, back to, whoops, sorry. Uh, sorry. 
back to bare rock, right? And then you watch it over very long periods of time. This is like 420 million years ago where the pro proto soils of the first lichens and they built our soils. And, uh, but this happens in a much quicker way to get to here. Um, and so this is where there's this, I don't know if I should use the word strategy, but natural systems will build resilience over time to start preparing themselves for the next disturbance whether that be fire or um, hurricanes and so forth. And I learned that one uh, the hard way. But as you move along uh, this trajectory, the resilience increases. And uh, by the time you get out to the mature end of this, here's a, just a quick list of things that start to happen in that process. Um, Okay, so the thing that I think uh, is interesting because you, you got to ultimately compare it with what people are doing. Uh, these systems are becoming dominantly perennial, like over 90%. They start off with annuals that give that quick scab, that green cover that, um, that builds the micro, uh, microclimate for the next species and they make the, nec uh, the, the next uh, microclimate that gives uh, shade and a little moisture to the species that can't handle that pioneer, those pioneer conditions. Um, so dominantly annual, genetically rich polycultures that are high in biomass, they conserve water and water quality, they conserve and build topsoil, maximize symbiotic relationships, moderate climatic extremes, generate diverse microclimates, uh, they have an efficient use of on-site energy resources, complex nutrient cycling systems, and we can translate all of these into agroecosystem applications. Um, and then everything has multiple functions. So you start to get an idea, well, on the other hand, if you drive you know, from here to Colorado, you'll see dominantly annual genetic, genetically poor monocultures of hybrids and GMOs, low in biomass, uh, they decrease water and its quality, they lose and pollute topsoil, minimize symbiosis, emphasize competition, increase climatic extremes and reduce microclimates, waste on-site energy and resources, and bring it in from far away, damaging nu nutrient cycles, and there's single functions in those landscapes. So, <laughs> I'm not advocating this, but if you didn't know anything and you just did 180 degree off of what is the mainstream uh, land use, you'd probably do pretty well. Um, I think it's worth spending some real deep observation time and knowing what you're doing and then just kind of going off a simple response like that. But the point is that we're not just a little bit off track uh, in terms of the mainstream. Yes? Uh, it depends on where you are, but um, I would say the shade intolerant trees, is that the one you're saying? Or the, Oh, the top one. Well, those would be your, your oaks and uh, hickories and beech and, and, and those trees that come in in the, in, in the mature end of the spectrum. And then underneath, you'd have different uh, understories, and that's where you'd start getting into your medicinal plants and your, your more diversity of mushrooms and wildflowers and so forth, uh, ginseng, golden seal, the interesting um, uh, plants with medicinal properties, you know, the mushrooms with polysaccharides and, um, you know, things like that. So these are some things that we can do to uh, accelerate um, <clears throat> that process in the landscapes that we have. So if you, if you have a pasture and it's really been hot and dry for, say, two or three weeks and you're low organic matter in that pasture, it's going to be brown and those animals are going to be laying on the edge of the field somewhere panting. Uh, milk production, meat production, et cetera, are going to all go down. And, uh, but if you, if you strategically planted the trees in there, uh, they'd be grazing all day long and cool. So the trees are evapotranspirating and cooling in the hot weather. And then when it gets cold at night, they condense and cool, uh, warm. Um, so they create these microclimates. They buffer extremes. That's really the point. All the extremes can be buffered with the proper kind of landscape architecture. Um, so we'll see some more forest farming examples uh, and also uh, uh, alley cropping, just having windbreaks of trees. And these can be cut uh, to manage the shade if it gets too shady for the crops. 
um, and then turned again into biochar and energy and so forth. Um, riparian zones, uh, ecological uh, gold mines for lots of species because of the water and the other species, and it, depending on how you plant it. Um, this is that edge I was talking about. You see this bump in species where the land meets the water. Well, you've got all sorts of other cover types that can come together, and some species need four different cover types within a daily range, um, like a bobwhite quail. You'll only see them where they can, within you know, a day range, they will um, be able to access all four types of cover. Um, so let's see. The alley cropping technique, these are basically classic agroforestry techniques. You can get much more complex ones. Um, that, that slope, uh, rows of trees on slopes that I mentioned uh, in, in the tropical system, you know, the, these are the kind of things that happen. Um, mentioned this already. So lots of different iterations of this or, or possibilities. You know, this is poultry, uh, pastured poultry systems between rows of tree crops and uh, vegetables. So as I mentioned, I just, uh, this year I was asked to start, I do organic, I don't know if I mentioned, but I, I inspect organic farms over about half of the United States. And I, over the last 28 years, have seen um, just about everything, or at least I thought. I, a couple years ago, I saw a camel dairy, which was uh, selling colostrum for $50 an ounce for autistic children. That was a new one. Um, but uh, this is golden seal in one of these thinned forest situations. Um, I'm working with a group called United Plant Savers that's uh, setting up plant sanctuaries and um, what, yes? It's really, it's like, it's really remarkable what you're doing. I know a woman in Vermont, part of that group, and it's interesting, she's planting, I think, like golden seal and other plants that they can put in her region. One interesting thing is when you can leave endangered plants to turn, other endangered plants seem to return with them. Mm -hmm. really yeah. Right. Yeah, so this is this understory uh, work that we can do. And, and yes, it'll, you know, there'll be a lot of other species that are going to be happy about this. Uh, you can get a little more ecological than this. Uh, this is ginseng. I was recently at a ginseng conference in, uh, in West Virginia. Um, it's, it's in decline across the whole country. Some people say it's being over harvested. I would say under cultivated. Um, but um, really interesting plant, an adaptogenic plant. So the whole notion of adaptogens is fascinating. It's, uh, it moves the body toward balance, from a little bit like what compost does with pH. If you put compost in a, in a low pH soil, it'll move it toward neutral. If you put it in a high pH soil, it'll move it toward neutral. It just takes it toward where, uh, where the balance point is. Yeah. Yes, yes, and uh, so I, I guess I didn't mention, but uh, PCO in Pennsylvania asked me to start doing the uh, uh, shade-grown inspections, not just organic, uh, on ginseng for starters, but it's going to be a lot of different medicinal plants, and that's where they, they map, we map the protocols. I'll go in and look at the population, the percentage being harvested, what time is it being harvested, is it being harvested when the berries are ripe so that they're propagating them, are they planting them back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's because companies like Mountain Rose Herbs and Gaia Herbs, they don't want to support the stealing of ginseng and the, or the over-harvesting, and that's because the buyers don't want to participate in that. Um, so it's an interesting time. We're seeing the same thing. It's actually, a, a, the parallel is with in fisheries. At the, at the end of the fishery cycle, you know, the, um, we can do the same type of thing, uh, of, of bringing these populations back. And also the, the forest, the, the logging in, in Oregon, um, for example. Um, we, can, we can start to make responsible uh, marketing processes to, to track that. And there's new tools now with some of the blockchain stuff to, to keep it from being cheated. Uh, I think I'm going too slow. These are some of the really interesting uh, medicinal mushrooms. I've been growing most of these, uh, some of them, not chaga. Uh, the lion's mane is very interesting. I just got some fruit in it before I left. That's, that mushroom is one of the few um, plants, herbs that uh, increase nerve growth factor. Uh, for neuropathy, brain regeneration, etc., 
delicious mushroom too. So some of these are foods. Shiitake is, you know, anti-tumor um, immune system. Reishi is top-end immune herb. Turkey tail as well. All these things are phenomenal. The, the polysaccharides in these uh, these things and, and a lot of the other compounds. Um, okay. So you know, instead of the point is instead of you know. These are examples of something that you could be getting your electricity and your space heat and season extension to, to get this environment and then to, then to grow crops underneath them instead of cutting down the principle, cutting down the trees, living off of the interest, right? So there's a lot of examples. I mean, the chocolate is like a perfect one of that for me too, uh, but, but these, these are herbs are very similar. Uh, I don't know if how many people were here last year with uh, Christine Jones presentations on the the the, uh, the carbon liquid carbon pathway, but it's it's really quite stunning. You know how much um, how much carbon is being shared with the soil. It's, it's, her work was really the one that showed how much because previously to that it was being done in sterilized soil in pots and it was obviously a lot lower numbers, but in, in, uh, in a healthy situation, uh, this is really huge. It's, it's key for what we need to understand about our cover crops. And so those, th those secretions, those, those uh, exudates, are different for each plant. So when you start getting polyculture, say 10 species in a cover crop, you might be supporting you know, 100 times as many microbes because the, each plant is supporting different suite of microbes. Each of these things could go on for a long time. This is a connected plant. This plant here with that is going to be able to access pretty much all the, all the minerals in the A, B, and C horizons. This one here is going to be waiting for a farmer to, to give it fertilizer and um, is going to be begging for what it needs. This is fully connected and going to have um, really quite amazing Myco mycorrhizae is uh, Super important. So I don't know how many people are familiar with key line uh, agriculture, but it came out of Australia and it's a water management system. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. So you can do essentially what you're doing is you're mapping the the, the slope of a, of a piece of property and you're you're catching it at at the the place where it's going to start running off when it rains, and then you're catching it. And you're running it to the dry ridges about one inch and 10 feet drop, basically contours. You'll, I think I got something that shows it. So what you'll see is the water would have just run right down here on a heavy rain, right? And it'll take your soil with it. Instead, it, it catches, and these are also swales. If you go to Mark Shepard's talk tomorrow, he's uh, doing a lot with this. Um, and um, what was I gonna say? So instead of running down here, it catches here and runs out to this. This would be a dry ridge. And what it allows it to do is percolate into the soil. Water infiltration is really important here because when, you know, what's going to happen, this leads into a whole conversation about storage. And this applies not just to water. Um, in the next slide, you'll see uh, this, this shows like each year you go a little bit deeper. What you're doing is you're bringing uh, moisture, air, and, and warmth in the spring down into a deeper layer where the microbes can, uh, you know, so you're, you're, you're rapidly expanding. You can go, I've heard from five inches to 18 inches in, in like five years of, of expanding your living um, you know, depth of, of your soil. Um, so you're also capturing the water, you're running the swales into ponds and you're, these pocket dams, and you're hydrating the landscape. And, uh, and then dumping that water into the crops at that key point when, you know, in, in Australia where um, three months you got really dry. And so if you've stored your water in the soil and the organic matter, in, in the soil, uh, well, and, then, and also in, in these other ways, uh, it makes all the difference for, for if water is your limiting factor, which clearly is in Australia. So, you know, we need to really think about distributing the production and the diversity around where people live because when you start adding up the packaging and the travel, the average 1,300 miles of travel in a piece of food in this country, um, it, it's, it's just off the charts. But if people are growing most of what they need, again, not just food, but, you know, building materials, medicines and such, and they're consuming it right where they are, that, that really takes a massive load off the planet, especially when you've got billions of people doing it. 
Um, so this is how we move toward a, uh, away from that petroleum. As you look at the, the petroleum footprint in this other thing where people drive to the store every other day to, to get something that they could have had stored in, uh, in a root cellar, in an ice house, in a, um, <clears throat> in, a, in a freezer or dried or fermented. There's lots of ways you can store food for long periods of time. Nitrogen gas you can store for 10, 15 years, uh, dried products. You drive off the oxygen so it, it can't oxidize and, and no uh, weevils or anything will grow in it. We haven't even begun to really maximize the possibilities. Uh, this is just a couple examples of biomimicry uh, in the industrial world. Um, <clears throat> this is a train in Japan that's you know basically mimicking the, the, the front end of a, a kingfisher. Um, with 10% faster, 15% more energy efficiency just from doing that. Here's some building, some passive cooling in buildings based on the interior of a termite mound. And this goes on and on and on as far as the applications, some fascinating ones that have been developed. Uh, these are just some examples of my garden, uh, mixtures of fr fruits and, and uh, vegetables and uh, <coughs> This is the bigger field. Uh, this is my house up here. I've got a little pond that catches water. I can pump, I can run a spring from the other side of the hill, run it downhill back up the other side 24 hours a day into it. And, what, and then I have the roof, uh, water's coming off the gutters going into that pond. And I can pump from a well with a solar, when it's, nice thing about droughts is you got sun. And so if you've got water to pump, you can pump water all day long with all that energy. And then I pump, the last resort is I, I can pump out of the, I got a creek run along here. These are blueberries and raspberries and cover crops and vegetables and staples. This is just a personal garden. We have a community uh, land trust where everybody has a lifetime five acre leasehold with their homestead. And then we have bigger valleys and fields uh, for the staple crops. And we have a, a, a cooperative staple uh, crop system for some of these other, you'll, you'll see. So that's the little pond. It's only 30 by 15, holds about 18,000 gallons of water. I can run four different sources of water into it, and it's high enough above the, uh, the gardens that we were just looking at to where I can water everything without a pump, uh, just by gravity feed. Bees, this is, this is solar thermal. I've got photovoltaics on the roof. We're gonna get to, um, how to really put all these things together in the next piece. What time we got, by the way? Did I run over? What is it? 2.34. Were we supposed to stop at 2.30? Um, okay. Uh, we could pick up here in a half an hour, if that's what you want. We started late. I'll, I'm, I'll do whatever you guys want. I think it's probably good to take a break. Maybe 15, 20 minutes? Okay. I'll be here. <laughs> Uh, let's want to say 15 or 20, whatever that makes it. For about, of, of maybe 200,000 flowering plants. Oh, yep, yeah, sorry. A couple hundred thousand flowering plants, 20,000 plants were used historically for food. Uh, today, 20 or less make up 90 to 95 percent of the world's food supply. This tremendous narrowing and then you jump into another narrowing where you go from open pollinated to hybrid and another narrowing when you go to GMO, right? So this is a very old variety of uh, calico popcorn. Popcorns are very old. Um, you might have more genes in this era of corn than all the corn you see from here to Colorado uh, in these hybrids. And what you could do, and this gets into like the, the commons, the, um, uh, so point is, you could take a bushel of this corn and select out all the ones of similar colors and put them in a pile and have all these different colors and, and different fields with different colors. And they're gonna all come out mixed again, but if you mark which one's which and you keep selecting for that, selecting for that, you can pull out new varieties uh, you could breed out a shitload of, of corn varieties out of that one ear. So if you look at the USDA data uh, between 1804 and 1904 uh, of varieties of food plants across the board, from apples to wheat to vegetables, 
they're almost all about 90% gone. We've, we've lost, those are varieties, right? Uh, they've just been discontinued. The seed companies came in and bought up all the seeds and discontinued the open pollinated ones and, and uh, basically focused on the hybrids because they could control it. You can't save your seed. Uh, and you kind of can if you know enough about, about botany. But, uh, you know, with this, the thing when you read that, there's a book called Shattering by Pat, uh, let's see, Fowler and Mooney. It's a, it, it blew my mind um, when I first read it about this corporate takeover of, of the, and it's largely just because we were asleep at the wheel. You can blame them for trying to, you know, make a whole bunch of money and then, you know, control the market, but really it was our job. You know, what, what is, what is the, the consumer's excuse for, you know, not getting this plant diversity or animal diversity or, or anything else important to the next generation? That's, that's not a corporate job. You know, it's our job to do what's important. So if we, I guess where I'm going is that those 90% uh, losses of, of almost every crop, those are varietals. We don't know what genes were lost, right? And varieties like this have so many, so much genetic variation in it. And this gets into the, the you know, how I look at uh, diversity is at least three levels. One is intra-species diversity, which is the genetic diversity in this crop, the variations that you could get out of it. You did all the breeding and stuff you can work with, but if you've got a really narrow hybridized variety, you, might, you can't even get the same variety back because it's already an F1 hybrid. Um, if we collect these really diverse ones, we're gonna be able to do a whole lot more going forward. We might be able to regenerate that 90% that's lost. We don't know really until you map the gene, actual genes and what genes were lost. But say intraspecies diversity for us, we might have 360 genes for every one human gene, so it includes the interior uh, genes of our microbiome or an animal, uh, even plants. They have lots of, um, they've got lots of biofilm uh, diversity of creatures in them. I mean, just the more you look, the more it balloons out. It's fascinating. So you got intraspecies diversity, then you got interspecies diversity, or the totality of species in your system. Um, and then you have habitat diversity that gets into those serial stages and um, th th that diversity I was showing if you combine lots of different cover types in the slide with the where those come together and you see that diversity bump. Um, so those are some ways to look at it. I mean, so you've got the microbiome uh, in there as well. Um, You've also got all sorts of other types of diversity and social systems and skill sets and vertical diversity in, in uh, plant architecture. Um, so a uh, lot to say on, on, um, on diversity and seeds. I think I had a little more to say on seeds, but a piece here. Okay. Um, kind of got it. So yes, um, one good news piece, you know, we tend to hear these stories of what all that we've lost, but uh, I don't know if people know Gary Paul Nabin, he's a, an author in the Southwest, and he was telling me that in the Appalachian region in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, the food plants have gone from like 5,000 to 20,000, and he was saying it was a function of, uh, well, it's a very diverse area, a very large and diverse area, but, um, <coughs> the farmers markets and the CSAs, where there's a story that goes with the variety. You know, it might be an Italian um, you know, strain of tomato or pepper or something that is in a particular dish that goes with, the, the story that goes with the seed uh, keeps people growing it. And so, the, and, but if, you're, if you just go to the supermarket and you're, you look at colors or whatever and you don't have a story behind it, it, it tends to get narrower and narrower over time. It was a fascinating uh, point, I thought. Um, and, and we'll take the good news wherever we can get it. So the other thing that's been emerging is the epigenetics, uh, the kind of the nurture part of all of this. Uh, in, in, in us, it's, um, it, I don't know if people are familiar with Francis Pottinger, but it looks like what his work is pointing to is 
Um, it's like a three or four year flywheel of positive or negative effects in, in the epigenetic load. And um, what, one of the things we're seeing with some of the, the minerals and the biological inoculants that we'll get a seed like, I'll show you in a minute. Um, uh, well, this is like where all the crops come from, the centers of diversity. Vavilov's work is really the one that pointed th these out and they're not evenly spaced. There's these concentrations. Um, this is this Eastern ag complex. I, maybe in the side conversation I was, uh, <clears throat> so we're, I'm, I'm like around the edge of that Eastern ag complex and it's not represented up there, but there's this Iva annua plant that the Indians were uh, in the archeological sites they, they found and the, uh, this plant has 45% oil. And um, so there's a, lot, there's a lot going on in these centers of diversity. But I guess I was on the epigenetic thing. And uh, th we're getting these seeds in the mail, right? You order seeds. And then after a few years, oh boy, that, that one. So this is this, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, this is this isoproportional bubble map. That's a, it's a Dahlgren taxonomy system. And the point is that this is a, like an evolutionary, uh, with what Alan Kapular calls a kinship garden. And so if you take this and you superimpose, it's a terrible slide, you can't read it, but um, you got all the, the common names of vegetables here. And then these are all super orders and they're placed, the, these, the, the bubbles are proportional to the number of species that are in them, in the world. And so you'll tend to see like, uh, you know, the, Orchids are you know, one of the largest and, and things like that. But these are different than the Linnaean taxonomy. The interesting thing is you can take this map and you can say take a, a regional collection of seed varieties for New England or something and then look at what, where your representation is. You might have a whole bunch of them that aren't represented at all and you'll have a, a lot being, uh, you know, maybe a lot of the uh, Solanaceae and, and, and Brassicas but not very many of some other ones. Anyway, there's a whole story here. And this guy, pretty much of a plant genius, in my opinion, uh, he got into looking at the patent laws because what these companies did when they enclosed the commons and bought these varieties up and then patented them, um, and when they crossed those old, see, you got 10,000 years of spiritual breeding on a corn by native peoples, and then somebody comes along with a white lab suit and makes an F1 hybrid between two of them, and there's two genes difference, and they patent it take it out of the public domain. Well, he was getting into like, how do we put it back in the public domain? How do we take those patented varieties and breed them to our purposes for nutrition, for local adaptation to elevations or unique soil situations or problems that we have with, path, with uh, pests or something like that. And then when we get it to genes uniqueness, all we need to do is name it and, and basically put it on the market and it'll be legally protected. At least it was at the time when I was doing workshops with him. Uh, brilliant guy. Anyway, the, the whole thing about seed, uh, saving seed and, and what our responsibility is to the next generations, to what we pass on to them uh, is a really big deal. And I'm not saying that we're just talking about annual plant seeds. We're talking about all germplasm rare breeds of animals, uh, grafted you know, fruit materials, and uh, you name it. But getting it from here to there is critical because we're losing so much. Uh, if somebody takes their eye off the ball and doesn't value it, uh, we can't be very uh, sure that it's gonna be here. So this is the eight row flint corn that we've been growing. I'll have some on the table. It's, we think it's phenomenal. It makes a, we did a workshop this summer with the collaboration between BFA and uh, OFA in Ohio. Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Association that I work with and for as an organic inspector. And what we did was we looked at uh, nu nutrient density bumps in three different areas. One was in, in the selection of the seed, the different varieties. Uh, Alan Kapular did a bunch of work on uh, amino acids. He was looking at um, a, a kind of a unique way of looking at nutrition that um, if you look at proteins, you know, and you put it in your body and you, know, we, you, you break it down into amino acids. So he's saying, well, let's just look at the, at, the, at the diversity of amino acids in these plants and save you the work of kind of splitting the firewood to get it down to the pieces that you want. Uh, interesting take. But um, anyway, these, some of these old heirloom uh, crops have much higher uh, amounts. And we're gonna tease a lot of this apart, hopefully as we go forward with some of the the uh, infrared tools and such. 
Um, but this is a uh, very nice corn that we're growing for our own consumption, not animal feed. We've got other varieties that are will bear a lot, you know, a lot more per area, but this is as good as it gets as far as making tortillas and tamales. And so after the seed selection, then we went into the fields and we looked at the mineral balancing and the biological uh, development and the cover cropping, the effect on the nutrition of the plant. And then finally, we went into a section on, um, I wish I had slides of it. Um, <coughs> we set up a basically a corn uh, sheller, a hand corn sheller. So we put the ears in there, then we, they came out, and then we had the, the cooked corn with uh, lime or, or ashes, which is the nixtamalization process. Um, and then you, you had some washed, where you wash off the, the coatings on the seed coat. And then we had a grinder with a cordless drill on it and you ground it into masa. And then we had some already made up that was kneaded into, into masa and we put it on the, uh, the, the tortilla mill that you, you turn with the masa and you come out with the tortillas. And we had a biochar stove, which I'll have on the table probably tonight. Um, so the whole process was just lined right up from one to the other and you're handing out fresh hot tortillas at the other end of it and you're making biochar while you're making it. So that was fun. Um, all right, I'm going to wrap up on the seed. So there's a, I'll have some books on the table again, but uh, this guy, Alan Capular, he, he had some journals that are still out there if you can find them called uh, the Peace Seeds Research Catalog. Um, another resource book that's good is Cornucopia uh, by Stephen Fasciola. It's a fantastic, uh, just like amazing how much stuff is out there to, to play with from other countries and you can match up your elevations and latitudes to where you are and find some part of China that's you know just the same and grow the crops that you didn't even know existed. Um, Sturtevant's, Sturtevant's Edible Plants of the World. Um, okay, so I'll finish up on these crops. There's a whole section on bioremediation. There's a lot of times you got to take toxins out. We did a lot of work in the uh, in the, some of the urban uh, areas in Cleveland and, and the you know, Rust Belt territories, looking at what do you do with lead if you're trying to do community gardens in, in these areas. And it turns out if you have sufficient phosphorus present, the plant won't take it up. Uh, lots of things like that, but also biochar again, absolutely amazing uh, to be able to biofilter all sorts of things out. And um, many strategies on phytoremediation with plants, microremediation with, with fungi, uh, constructed wetlands, um, again, biochar. I designed a small uh, uh, biofiltration system for a, a, a very small da uh, Amish dairy farm where the cows were about 20 feet from the creek. And so we chained, we put a roof over the, the bedding pack and put biochar into that. We, we, we put poured a cement pad so that all the runoff would go into one of these 240-gallon uh, uh, tote, liquid totes, and filled that with biochar. And so he just shovels it out once a year, and it captures all the E. coli and everything that would have been right into that creek. I actually told him to do a small constructed wetland between there, but he didn't need to, it turned out. Anyway, many examples of, of taking toxins out that way. Um, <clears throat> you can use it as building material also. You can make a stucco on the wall uh, up to four inches thick, and it'll It'll not only thermally insulate and sound insulate, but it'll pull EMFs out of, your, out of the room. It'll regulate uh, moisture in, a, say, a winery or your house. Um, it's just amazing. It takes days to go through all the uses that are happening. Cardboards, papers, um, you know, lots of stuff with, you know, somebody mentioned biogas. Um, if you add it to the, the process, it'll enhance the gas output and things like that. This is... Uh, we're also I bought an old um, Alice Chalmers pull behind combine. We're, they're getting hard to find these days, but uh, it's a, only a six foot wide swath run on a small tractor, and it will harvest up to 100 different types of seeds. So we're now growing some of the old wheats. This is a turkey red and einhorn, einkorn, uh, and some of the, uh, the dry beans and barleys and things. These are dry beans. Um, this is a younger phase of the, the, uh, the corn uh, there. This was an experiment using this uh, volcanic mineral um, <clears throat> that I did, and it was uh, pretty amazing. The, uh, 
the results were dramatic. I think I got double the yield, deeper pigmentation um, with very small amount of it. And I'll have some of that on the table also and some free samples. Um, this is uh, buckwheat cover crop here. Buckwheat is a very, uh, very nice plant that I use a lot. It, it concentrates uh, calcium and phosphorus. It's, I have bees, so it's good for beekeeping. Um, Devin, Ohio? Yeah. Yep. Uh, and it grows so fast that if you've got a really bad weed problem in a field and, and uh, you can, if you just want to sacrifice a year to cover crop where you're going to really build fertility and you plant it, say, in May, at least in Ohio, uh, it'll grow, it'll outgrow the, the weeds and it'll get to this point where it'll flower, the bees will collect the, the nectar, and then the first seeds start getting hard. You can feel it in there. When, the, when, you, when you know you got about 5% of the seed head ripe, you just run through there fast with a disc and slice it into the soil. Within a week, you got a new crop of buckwheat, and then they race and they the, the, the weed seeds sprout, and, the, and then the buckwheat chokes them out again and then it gets another flowering, and, and then uh, you do the same thing again. And then by September, uh, what I'll do while it's flowering is whirly bird in my winter cover crop. It could be a, a, the following wheat crop or some grain for the next year. Um, and, then what, and then slice it in again, and it comes up buckwheat and the, the next winter cr crop. Uh, and then the first frost comes along and melts down the buckwheat, and then you've got a really nice weed control with significant amounts of phosphorus and potassium collected. When do you plant it in the As soon as you can after the, uh, it, it's, it's pretty tender, so you have to make sure the frost is done, but it's you know, May for us. Oh, so that's Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, anyway, I got uh, three, I've got five and a half bushels on 35 foot of row of the mineralized, the volcanic mineralized row, and um, uh, three on the on the non, and that's good soil. That's good bottom line soil. This year we went into some big, you know much uh, more diverse mixes. This here is sun hemp. I don't know if anybody's grown it. It's a it's a real tropical plant. It's a, a um, that was like twelve feet tall. This was just about a week or so before the frost this year. And there's another nine species mixed in it. There's millet and cowpeas and all sorts of other things. And then uh, there's another mix of like, uh, well, there's all sorts of stuff in here. These, these are all you know, cover crop mixes. After the crop came out, then we'd squeeze them in. But the cover crops are uh, really showing big differences in the, in the outcomes. This was the best stand I've ever had of um, Austrian winter pea. It was about four feet high when I tilled it in. It's rye and, and Austrian winter peas, and it was the only thing in all of Ohio that I saw that was bright green in February. We had that living root, and it was the sweetest thing I've ever tasted out of any garden, because it was so cold, it was producing all those sugars. And you can eat them, you can pick bushels of them, you know, and, uh, any time of the year that way. And uh, so I had just, I went with a rotavator. I thought I was gonna get stuck in about 10 feet uh, and just tie up my machine and everything, but it just, turned it right into the soil, and then when it dried, it, there was straw on the surface. So it, it was all uh, tremendous. All this material was in there, and we got the best corn crop ever that year. Um, and you, um, the winter peas and rye are planted about October. Um, it's interesting when you look at the data on it, sometimes the, the ones that are planted earlier don't do as well. So there's like a a window there, but uh, yeah, what a what a great, great crop. Whoops. So this is an example of the corn after we picked it, but in uh, on the last cultivation, we undersowed red clover. So all that we didn't have to do anything. I just went through with a brush hog and just you know chopped the the tops and let it lay. And so we've got a nice you know red clover stand for the winter. Um, again, that was right before the frost. You can see the sun hemp in there. And, and, I'm sorry, you mentioned sun hemp twice. What, what actually is that? It's a leguminous tropical cover crop, and I, I didn't, wasn't even sure what to do with it when it's, you get something 12 feet tall. What we did, we just threw in some, some seed right into the mix and then uh, mowed it off and you know let it come up, let the next cover crop come up through it. But the cover crops are just amazing and fun. These are the... Um, the uh, naked seeded pumpkins. 
uh, it's a uh, Styrian pumpkin. Uh, Europe is growing a lot of them. Um, very, very nice plant. I mean, it's one of the densest, nutrient dense food I've had. I mean, the nice thing is you, you bust them open and you've got handfuls of pumpkins and you're just ready to eat, just like that. And <laughs> it's too simple. And, and they, they're really high in zinc and they're, they're on par with almost any nut and you don't have to shell them. So it's a, a naked seeded pumpkin or a Styrian pumpkin. That variety is um, Lady Godiva. We like them. Uh, we got it through the mail, but okay, what I was gonna say before, I, I cut myself off on the epigenetics. Um, so after even two to three years using these biological techniques with the cover crops and the minerals and whatnot, our seed is at least double, possibly three times what, what we received it as. So you're seeing really you know, profound changes, and that's just what you can see. Um, it's you know, adapting to, to the place. And the, so you don't have to rebuy seed every year? No, no, all of these, everything I just showed you was all open pollinated. Oh. So we got it, for, once you get a variety that's open pollinated, you don't let it cross. So that's a curcurba de pepo. It will cross with a zucchini or a other pumpkin or anything in that species. So you got about four, maybe five species of pump of uh, curcurbits. And so if you pick one, of, we I used to grow seeds for seeds of change commercially, and so we have to keep the, the purity of the seed. So uh, you could isolate, you can hand pollinate, all, all kinds of other. If we had more time to go into seed saving, uh, these are just some fruit mushrooms. They're just all on the farm. When you were in between the different pumpkins that you're growing here now, do you, I don't know what the water precipitation is in Iowa, do you uh, water or is it uh, More and more, yeah, you know, but again, you know, if you get your uh, organic matter way up, yeah. you have you got longer and longer windows bef between, you know, how, how, when it's rain lasts. So if you've got 1% organic matter, uh, versus four or five percent, you're gonna have a really big difference on when you have to water. But yeah, I, I do uh, water. No, we're not watering any of the, the stable crops. Only the only the garden shots, and I didn't distinguish which were which, but the the, the corns and the beans and the grains and the um, pumpkins, uh, winter squash, we do a lot of winter squash, zero watering. These are just some of the BFA uh, chapter things we do, uh, pawpaw festival here. You can see that corn, that's the, that's the eight row flint corn there. We, this was a tractor that was built out of just sort of off the shelf, uh, non-patented parts um, from some folks down in Alabama that designed it for Cuba. Um, and they're, you know, we were interested in, do, um, they did a tour around the country and we were their first stop. So we hosted a little get together on it and um, Pretty interesting little tractor. We're interested in converting it to electric. Um, the other thing we're looking at is gasifying with biochar. So you take a portion of the biochar, we'll, I'll show you that. So this is a friend of mine who has a, this is an old Alice Chalmers G converted to electric. So it's a cultivating tractor, it doesn't have PTO on it. We did a, got a grant a few years back uh, to do all things biochar, and I was consulting for about 25 farms on how to use it in livestock operations and different cropping operations. It was a lot of fun, but we brought in this uh, <laughs> friend of mine from Pencil, a couple, actually, uh, Dale Hendricks is here somewhere. I don't think he's in the room. Um, but Gary Gilmore from Pennsylvania, he's just a kind of a wild man. He's got all kinds of gadgets, and so we've got cookers here. Uh, we were also doing gasifiers. You have a little uh, walk-behind tractor that was being, uh, I think I got a slide, let's see. So this is the gasifier, you see the charcoal, that, and you light it. This one was hooked up to a generator, um, and then there's another one that's hooked up to the walk-behind tractor. Uh, basically, we're just looking at what's the plan, you know, when either you can't get petroleum, diesel, or gas, uh, or it's too expensive for your farming operation. We're just looking at the next thing to, to shift over some of the same machinery, but run it off of the farm. Uh, and we've got, we got 180 acres of wood, so th there's no shortage. And um, some of these gasifiers you can do from, you can also gasify from wood. 
They make a little more smoke, don't burn quite as clean, heavier to haul around if you're driving. Um, <clears throat> but there's a, there's a guy, old guy, and Wayne Keith, anybody seen his videos? He's got a truck uh, down in Alabama that uh, does like 80 miles an hour. He, he loads it in the morning and fires it up, and then he moves his big bales of hay and moves some cows, drives into town. Every time he, he's done with something, he just like shuts it down, not completely, so it doesn't go out, so you got hot coals in there and then fires up the fan and then it takes off again and he drives it all day and then, but you, there is a way that if you uh, cut the oxygen before it goes all the way to ash, that you can actually wind up with charcoal after having done your driving. So that's, there's some, you know, there's these biochar or gasifier meetups and stuff in Indiana and other places and these, there's a whole following of this stuff, pretty interesting. Um, yeah, I've got a, like I said, I got a, an example of a, these are all different, some cook stoves here. I don't, it's not running, but I've got the one I've got is like right in here. It's, it's taken apart. This is a type of a cook stove. This is a cook stove. And they all make charcoal when they're done cooking. Um, so anyway, we had a lot of fun. This is the uh, champion. So you can see how clean it's burning. That's bamboo um, burning in there. really works well. That, this is a champion. It's called a champion because it won the championship on the clean burning. Um, works excellent. Um, this is so, I guess where I was heading here, this is a winter at my place and all of a sudden it gets a lot more challenging to get your electricity when they're covered in snow. I climb up on the roof a lot and clean it off and, um, and then this is where the Stirling engine generator really starts to shine because you can be running it. It produces 30,000 BTUs of hot water continuously, 24 hours a day, and produces 1,000 watts continuously. So that's 24 kilowatts for a 24-hour cycle all winter long, as long as it's cold. So you're getting your, and the whole time you're building up biochar for your compost pile or your poultry house or however you're going to use it. It's going to eventually be in your soil. Um, so the p couple pieces that start going together with these are when you start linking up, this is the, a really interesting new battery. The company went out of business, unfortunately, went bankrupt, but now they're out of bankruptcy and there's gonna be a new, um, they're gonna be coming out any time now. They've kind of gone dark, they're not responding to email yet, but uh, it's a saltwater manganese carbon battery. So incredibly common materials, totally non-toxic, nothing to explode, nothing, that's rare, and <clears throat> it's just so superior over the old lead acid batteries. I mean, this is a single battery here, and it's 48 volts, whereas before I had to have um, eight six volt batteries in a, in a uh, series. And so the, if one went bad, and you're in this dilemma, like, okay, what do I do? Get rid of all the rest of them, or put a new battery in with a bunch of old ones, which you're not supposed to do, it was just a pain in the butt. Plus, <clears throat> with lead acid, you only cycle them halfway down, right? So you have to set your charger or, or whatever, to, or you stop using it, you conserve or whatever, when it gets to 50%, because you'll damage them if you keep cycling below that. These will go all the way to zero, no problem. You don't have to, um, you can't hurt them like that. The only, one, only thing you really have to know is that you can't discharge them too fast or charge them too fast. That just means you have to have enough batteries for your calculations of how much your house uses or how fast your charger charges, right? Um, <clears throat> so they're fantastic. They will probably, they, they get 3,000 full depth charges out of them. And the thing I've been thinking about lately is that if you, if you plug in, so you got this photovoltaics, you got these uh, nice base, but if you put um, the Stirling engine generator into this mix, what's gonna happen is that in your leanest time of the year in the winter, you're gonna to be topping that up every day. They're not gonna be cycling very deep. So you'll probably double the lifespan of the batteries. If you had 12 of these batteries, it, it would pay for the whole bio, uh, Sterling generator just on that alone. And you got all the other values to, to consider. Yeah. 
I looked into nickel iron for about three years. I was getting close to buying them, but you can mess those up. They, you, if you don't put water in them or if, you, uh, if they get too cold um, and they're about twice as expensive, etc. So I, I think they're interesting, um, but I decided to use these when, once, once these came online. Carbon. Aquion. They'll be coming back available. Yeah. And they're out of Pittsburgh area. Very excited on that because I just, you know, I can't tell you how many times I was swearing about lead acid batteries and how many stains or clothes with holes in them or, you know, just how, many, how, how fast they'd go bad. Uh, I just never wanted to look back again on, on that. So this is the Stirling engine gasifier. Um, and uh, so let's see, I can also, it might be easiest to show you the video now. Yeah, okay, so this excites me because I'm off the, I've been off the grid for 38 years and, and um, 10, 10 of those years I didn't have any electricity or a phone or running water, but um, that prepared me kind of nicely for going to Central America. But these things are available at 250, at a size that's 250 of these. So say a, a housing development or a large industrial Maybe not that large, but I mean 250 and then up. They go up into megawatts. I was interested in the 250 kilowatt because I was working with the, my friend in the Ozarks and we were looking at these big blocks of forest. Uh, Penny, you know David Hankey, that's who I'm referring to. Um, and so we're talking large amounts and that technology is interesting. The 250 particularly is the, the largest, the smallest one that you can still put on a semi-trailer. Because if you, if you buy something bigger than a semi-trailer, it's going to be stationary and you're going to like use up all the wood around you and you're going to say, what else can I burn? And you're going to go over the line in terms of what you probably should be doing. But if, it's on a, if you can move it from forest to forest, one they've already you know, located or already you know, aggregated all of their material and then just burn it up. But that, you could pull it into Detroit and burn up a bunch of buildings. Uh, you know, it doesn't care. And so, um, so this unit, we've been waiting for a long time for the, something like this to happen. And um, so I, I got wind of it. I started working with them. And the engineers don't really know about soil or biochar or how to ecologically source the feedstocks to feed it with. And so I'm looking at all those pieces and then working with uh, getting these things out to people who really understand what they are. You know, so a lot of the Mennonite Amish are, are moving into solar now. Um, they're off-grid, and so it, it's really sweet for off-grid, but it doesn't have to be. You could be grid, grid intertide, no problem. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I'll just do this about two minutes. We, what we did is went down to uh, Asheville, North Carolina in the spring. It was the first public breakout of this thing. Anybody knew it existed, and we, it was the Mother Earth News Fair in Asheville, North Carolina. So... Let's see, these are inverters, you, got, you need batteries. This is an extra Stirling engine. And I'll get to a certain point when it comes back down. Right, well, I don't know if that's the best place, but this is an extra Stirling engine. You can just because, no. Okay, so you can see this goes up and down when the gasifier is going, and I'll show you in a minute the, where the pellets and the, the uh, where the gases come into this burner, it goes up to about 1,850 degrees Fahrenheit, and it basically the way the Stirling engine works is it it heats this cone, which is up in here. As it raises up, it gets into the heat, and the differential between the 1,800 degrees and the coolness of the bottom, it runs a piston up and down. It's a it's a free piston. Uh, Stirling engine in a, in a uh, helium cylinder. And it makes uh, 1,000 watts of electricity constantly. And I think this is a little low. I think it's actually closer to 30,000 BTUs. Uh, and so there's a heat exchanger that, that cools it. You've got a glycol loop that cools this thing, and then you have a heat exchanger that makes 
hot water for your domestic heat, your domestic hot water. This is a, um, a radiator off of a Ford Fiesta or something that you can easily go to hot water to hot air. So if you want hot air in your house, it's no problem. Or you can you know, pump the water around to where you want it and run one of those. A lot of uh, basically just uh, you know, circulating pumps to deal with. Uh, I'll show you in just a minute. So that's where the biochar comes out. Every 12 hours, you've got to drop the biochar out at this point. It might be a continuous auger situation at some point. So the auger, the pellets are going in the top. The uh, pyrolysis zone is right there. This was just the mobile setup. Um, yes. Yeah, so I wasn't real excited about that aspect at first, um, but you can look at regional pellet making for, you know, to get somebody making the pellets for a number of people. There, the wood chip burner is almost done. So it's, this is going to go into wood chips. You have a chipper on your three-point electric tractor and you're making your own wood chips because you've gone down the, gone down the row and... Um, and chip them up and, and then run them through this thing and then you get your, your biochar from the chips as well. So does that do the auger system or just the biochar to make There are different augers on it. Um, the one that goes from the pellet, there's an auger, and then there's another auger in it that kind of kicks it out of the pyrolysis zone down into the biochar, which is a uh, chamber which has got no oxygen, so it goes out. And that's the trick about getting rid of more than that, because if it gets access to air, it'll burn all the way to ash. So that, that's actually act, actively being worked on. Um, so it's evolving, but it's exciting to me. <laughs> uh, let's see. While we're on that, I had a... Uh, uh, the, the very first one went out to, to um, Living Web Farms down in Asheville. I've been working with them did a two-day training program with them um, recently on how to run it, and they took the first one. I'll be getting the second one, and the third one is going to uh, OSU. We got a grant to start a four-acre organic student farm on this 500-acre footprint of a, a farm that was donated to the land-grant college system, so I'll be working with him on putting a um, curriculum together for that, and so we'll tie that into a greenhouse. Very nice for like a germination greenhouse for operations that have germination greenhouses where you can run the hot water through the germination table to get the plants up in flats and then move them to another greenhouse and then germinate some more. That's a pretty good application for it. Uh, lots of possible applications. Um, okay, so now we've got photovoltaic saltwater batteries. Um, biothermal, so the solar thermal, so you got hot water from when the sun's shining from the sun and from this. You can now start heating things, um, hot tubs, <laughs> you, you use your imagination, hot tubs in greenhouses. Um, and then the next thing I'm going to be, uh, I'm researching right now is uh, absorption chillers. They're very interesting technology. You put hot water in and you get cold water out. So in the summertime, we could theoretically use these to, to cool a food storage room. And so we, you can kind of start getting it. Where I'm looking at is combining root cellar, ice house, uh, chiller, and then you got lots of extra electricity because I already don't know what to do with all the electricity in the summertime. So I'll have an extra 1,000 watts that I'm running it then. Um, but to, to have food... Yeah, we should probably, I should probably list the whole thing out because you've got all these values from all the upgrades in the forest that happened from taking the fire uh, danger down and then the, the competition was released. You got more nuts and more wildlife and then you got, you know, uh, medicines and such. And then you got your electricity and you got your space heat. And if you're space heating a greenhouse, you got food production, extent, uh, season extension. And then if you've got the chiller in there, now you've got food preservation. Um, you know, so who knows where the limits on all this are, but the interesting thing about the, um, the chiller is that you can run it the other way, put cold water, you could pump cold water from a creek in the, in the, cold, uh, yeah, in the cold, 
and you make a little extra heat from that same thing. So your return on investment on both the sterling and the, the chiller are going to work in the opposite uh, seasons when you otherwise would, uh, wouldn't have been using it. So they can be used year round and then you're making more biochar. So the longer you're running this thing, you're running the carbon backwards. Yes, yeah, they do. The, the one I'm looking at is because uh, you have to match the, out, the, the, the amount of hot water coming out of the, um, the sterling, right? So it's about a seven and a half kilowatt, which is a real nice match. There's one out of Spain. Um, that's a lithium bromide version. Um, anybody got a time? Uh, give me. And we got till what? Oh, okay. We're good. Um, so yeah, lots of possibilities there. Really, you know, when you start looking at this whole thing of, uh, the way it works is you get a huge abundance of things. You get a big rainfall, so you got water catchment, right? You get, um, you can freeze a whole bunch of water if it's cold and save it for the whole year. I've, I've seen ice houses, Amish ice houses with vegetable storage that were four times the size of this room. Uh, with, a, with a large pond right outside, back, right out back with a, a ramp, and one day a year they cut all this, the ice, they load it one time, and they've got, you know, massive food storage uh, just from that. So there's many ways to do these things, but the point is you got to catch it when you got it, and you got all those summer tomatoes, you do something with them, and you'll have them year-round. But most people are just in that one or two-day thinking, and it's like that's where so much waste is happening. Um, in an insulated room that's say, say it was in this room and say that there was a room back behind those two or three doors that had 12 inches of insulation in the walls and an opening on the back side with a ramp that went to the pond. So you cut all the ice and you pack that whole thing and the, it was amazing because it was so low tech. There was a thermometer on the wall and if it was a little warmer than they wanted it, and this, this thing had like these huge bins of potatoes and things like that, that in May weren't even beginning to sprout yet. And so what they did is they just had a door on a, you know, just open the door a little bit. If it, if it was too warm, close it a little bit. If it was too cold, I mean, kind of Flintstones level technology, but it's, you know. I'm sorry, where is the heat? In here, this whole room. It's here and the ice. Yep, yep. I didn't see any fans, no. I've seen ones where they had an ice house and they had a, a th went through the floor and they had a, 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 a little, like, a, a big refrigerator downstairs. And so the, the cold would just drop through the floor and they could open and close vents. Uh, yeah, we, we've just had so much access to fossil fuels and cheap electricity that we just switched off our thought processes. Um, there's bigger, uh, let's see. So yeah, then we can start looking at wood gasifications for engines and tractors, electric vehicles, um, you know, farm vehicles that are all decked out with, uh, what, I, what I'm thinking about doing is a, a separate battery bank on wheels like a golf cart or a four wheel drive golf cart with inverters on it and electric chainsaws and water pumps and chicken, uh, uh, chicken fence chargers and you, you name it. Uh, all on a vehicle with that you can drive around and split wood, saw wood, do whatever you need to do, pump water, and then when you're not using it, pull it up to the house and the extra power when your other batteries will charge those batteries. And if you need the power for your house, you can use it off of your mobile battery bank. Um, all those kinds of things. So we're really talking about just using the budget of what's coming out of the sky where you live. Sunlight, water, that's, that's, the, that's the economy, and you get creative on how to do that. So I mentioned the, the bigger 250 kilowatt. There's Trumps. Everybody, anybody ever hear of a Trump? It's a, it's a wacky piece of technology. They use it on the, on, um, oh, when they're installing big um, hydropower plants, like up in Canada and stuff, they make a hole in the ground that's pretty deep and you have a flowing water and you drop it, put it water into a funnel and it falls all the way to the bottom and then it goes 90 degrees and halfway to the other side before it comes all the way back up to the surface. 
there's a, a smaller pipe that picks up the small bubbles that go down the tube with it, with the water. It carries these micro bubbles and they come shooting up and create compressed air, cold compressed air. You can cool with it, you can run compressed air tools, uh, and it's better for those tools because if it, on a humid day, if you're running a compressor on your compressed air tools, it's hard on them. Uh, so that's a wacky one that I had never, an Amish guy told me about that. Um, yeah, heat pumps, etc. cetera. So um, it goes on and on, but I think uh, I'll open it up for discussion and questions for a while. Uh, I've been talking a while. Yeah. Have you ever researched uh, green production of hybrids, ammonia, and how it's cheaper than electric vehicles and doesn't produce pollution? Uh, I have not. I'd, I am by no means uh, an expert on this stuff. I've just been making things work, but I'd be curious to hear about it if you if you think it's uh, eligible. What are you making it from? What's the feedstock? What do you? We produce it from solar energy, from wind energy. It's uh, one of the experts on this concept is a guy named Paul Allen Kirchhoff, CEO. I'll have to look into that. Huh. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think people start getting really creative when there's a, when there's a need. And um, so it's going to be an interesting time that way. Say that again, green ammonia. Paul Curto. So the question for the recording is, uh, well, more of a comment about um, using ammonia from wind or solar as a fuel. Any other thoughts about anything we touched on? There was quite a bit there, and I should have stopped more often for it to come. Yes? Mm-hmm. Um, each battery gives you four to eight hours of runtime. Okay. I need. Is it a is it a cultivating tractor or does it have a PTO? There's two models. Um, they both have PTOs based on the feedback um, from the problems that they want to meet. Uh, the e farm has three tanks in the attachment of a The Ogan. Where is that based out of? Okay, I think I'm. Yeah, 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 yeah. I watch. I've been watching that one for a while. They didn't ever seem to be available. Are they actually for sale now? So we are, um, the market share for the E2 now, and the E Farmer is going to be ready for the second quarter. And um, cool. we can tell if we more readily adopted the uh, California Infrastructure Funding um, you know, units for the lower carbon options. Um, we're kind of dragging our feet, but hopefully we can get to the finish line. How many horsepower did you say? It's a it's 25 to 50 um, feet, and that's because of the electric motor unit and the electric motor. Right, right. Um, it's like twice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it one motor, or is it one for the PTO and one for the drive? Uh, one motor. Okay. So
Cool. I've been waiting for that because I mean, I'm not that interested in just going point A to point B in an electric car, but um, give me a tractor and I'm all happy, yeah. Right. What kind of batteries? Uh huh. Yeah, I wonder about these saltwater batteries. They're they're kind of heavy, but for a tractor, it wouldn't matter as long as you don't tip it more than forty five degrees. But if you're tipping the tractor more than forty five degrees, you got other problems to worry about. Cool. Yeah, I'll look into that. Price point roughly? It's at 40000 right now. Um, and we're looking to use it with the Tesla Model 3 and the Model 3 Plus. Um, really? Wow. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely be looking <laughs> that up. <laughs> nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they made a, let's see, a 60-inch, a 66-inch, 72-inch, and those, I think those were all of the, uh, there might have been one bigger than that that were still pulled behind. Um, and they've got a lot of moving parts, but they're pretty, pretty cool. I mean, we, we were doing grains just like in a 55-gallon drum, which gets old real fast, and then uh, one of the women on the farm got this big idea of, of taking a chicken plucker Rub rubber fingers and putting a piece of plexiglass over it and some tarps and, and holding the bunches of dry beans over and it, it actually works fairly well but you still get tired of that pretty quick. Um, so this was really a nice thing. And, and what's the company? Alice Chalmers. They're, they're old. I mean they don't they don't make them anymore but they're out there. I just found one for a, a friend of mine who's running the student farm in Oberlin, Ohio. Um, so they're going to be getting that one and then there were two other 66 inches which you could make one good one out of and that got sold before I could get it to my friends in, at OSU. Uh, but yeah, there, there's a lot of pieces of, of equipment came out of that era, 40s, 50s, early 60s that are really pretty sweet. We call them precious metals <laughs> instead of gold and silver, stuff that's going to actually do something positive. Yeah. So in some of the urban areas, it might be tough, but anywhere that you can do a wood stove, uh, I've got a really efficient wood stove, probably 88% efficient. I think this thing is up in the 93, 94%. It's burning way hotter. It's almost 2,000 degrees. So there's, one, you know, there's, there's a period when you're first lighting it when you're going to get some smoke. But once it's running, uh, if you're not stopping and, and, and starting it a lot, uh, so... To get to the carbon negative part, you kind of have to burn something. Um, I think there's going to be work on it, you know, um, you know, what is it, UL listings and things like that are getting worked out. And the, um, now a person who's, you know, in that situation that has natural gas already, even though I'm trying to move away from natural gas uh, because of the fracking aspect, if they're using it already, you can plug one of these units, and I've got some handouts here for anybody that wants one. Um, this thing is just plug and play. You put it on the wall and, and it runs on natural gas and it makes 24 kilowatts of electricity. So it'll spin your electric you know, meter backwards. Um, you can do a grid inner tie. Um, it, you know, it makes hot water. You can do, again, whatever you want with the hot water. Um, you're not getting carbon negative out of it, but you're, you're moving things in an interesting direction. Uh, 
know, say a greenhouse that has a, a gas heater or something, and uh, you want to need some electricity. Uh, those are, I think, about ten thousand. But uh, other than that, uh, let's see. What else could you do? I mean, these are pretty clean, but there's regulations that I, I mean, I moved out in the way out in the country where nobody was going to ever ask me anything about anything, and that's kind of where I like to be. But I, I understand it. I've seen some, you know crazy stuff where people had to put in fake septic systems that were $20,000 just to get past to be able to do a composting deal. Uh, but California went through a lot, of, a lot of stuff with composting toilets and you know, eventually you get enough people pushing it through, there's, there's ways to do it. We put a uh, constructed wetland in, in the farmhouse. We have a collective farmhouse that turned into like a guest house. And uh, quite a long time ago we put a, I think it's a 20 by 40 rubber, uh, EPDM rubber lined uh, wet, wetland with uh, gravel in it and uh, I think originally it was sweet flag. It doesn't really matter what aquatic plants you put in there. And it goes from the septic to the leach, it's not a leach field, but it comes into a header and it kind of goes across in a stream and then it picks it up again on the other side. And that has worked really well. Um, people have used those in some places that are progressive. Uh, <laughs> Again, you get similar similar issues, but um, yeah, there's there's a lot to work out on, on all this. Uh, back, and then I'll come back to you in a minute. Yep. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, institutions are rough. I mean, I just go behind enemy lines a lot and, and find you know progressive professors and, and you know we write grants and get things pushed through. Ohio State is is very it's it's a monster of an organization, right? And it's it's weird to be in there in a way, but within it, they they just they spend like a hundred or eighty million dollars on a, a really major project called the In Fact Program. They, they're trying to really position themselves to be sort of ground zero for sustainability, and yet they're, they're nowhere near where they where their wording is, so we can work with that and hold them to it and say, look, you, you got language in your, in your uh, that you raised money for, for external partners for education and things, so we're putting together a 10-day uh, training program in the spring. Dan's gonna come in for two days of it and do his two-day thing, and I'm gonna do seven more days of, you know, biochar and all kinds of manner of interesting things for his, but this is one professor, a friend of mine, who's in the engineering department, and so the grant paid for a year. We'll see how it goes, you know, everything, you gotta jump hoops for everything. And we got the money for, the, for, the, for this, but then you gotta jump hoops of actually be putting it in somewhere. It looks like it's gone through, but there's two greenhouses going in, there's gonna be a photovoltaics and batteries, and then a bunch of different cropping systems, and, so there's a 500 acre footprint. We're hoping to do something impressive and then expand that out over time because there's conventional dairy, just like you're saying, it's all you know, GMO chemical, this and that, so. Yeah, yeah, you can probably expect that, but it's worth doing. Yeah. Um, I, I've I been, I've been that. Even if the students who help to construct it were off their cell phones and out of the mall just for that part of it, which we impacted those students, even if it didn't help one the organization that was hmm. listed in the school. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I inspect the organic farm uh, farms on the campuses in you know West Virginia University Ohio State uh, MSU up in Michigan Oberlin College uh, Purdue so I get I kind of get uh, a, an inside view of things and what's possible and then can you know work with the people that I see are are ready to go uh, and it, it's you know I've been um, visiting a lot of these BFA chapters that are in development and um, trying to hook them into acad academia and some of the bigger organic growers and get enough growers to actually buy bulk amounts of minerals and get, uh, 
it's the only way you can get you know wholesale prices to small growers is to aggregate a lot of them and get these bigger purchases and uh, there's a lot of strategies that we're looking at uh, growing these chapters out and connecting them up and networking between them and we're literally trying to grow mycelium you know like getting getting a little bit growing here and then you know getting them to grow together and put together a whole food system because the, the food security is pretty terrifying if you look at what's actually on the ground. Uh, we usually try to get people just kind of do a bit of an analysis and look at how much food is being grown in your region versus how much is getting trucked in every day. Without getting into the quality of it, just how are you going to have food if, you know, what I see even in our area, which is kind of a mecca of local food in, in the state of Ohio, uh, one storm comes in on the, on the news and everybody runs to the store and strips off the shelves on the first day. You know, by day three, people are getting agitated at the gas stations, and you know, by, by day five, you're getting the first fist fights, and then you know, day seven, it's road warrior. But uh, we're that close to to things coming apart. Um, people have no idea, and it's you know, we used to have grain reserves, we used to have things in place, and people are just acting like uh, like you can go out on a stormy day with your kids and not throw a life preserver in the boat. It's that level of, of unthinking and. Uh, I don't, I don't understand it. I was just with two of the city elders in the event. They said that when people went to Sandy Rock, they didn't know they had a lot of wood that people had brought in, and they were making these bonfires in the fall. They said when the sub-zero weather's come, there was no wood left because people don't have the concept of resource management anymore and preservation. It's really short-term thinking is, is yeah. what it is and uh, an aversion to physical work. I, we could have gone a lot further into the psychology of this whole thing, but uh, so Thomas Edison said this thing back in his day that uh, he said, opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. And I've been laughing about that for years, but when you burrow into it, you know, at first, I think in his day it might have just been straight up laziness, but I think now it's that if you look at this crashing mitochondrial energy at the cellular level, um, people just don't have the energy. I mean, I've watched people, you know, North Americans try to keep up with, you know, the Mayans, you know, that I, that I work with in the, down there. And it's getting harder and harder to have peop see people with stamina to work, physical work in the field, um, even though they're going to be, eat, what's that? Maybe they're yeah, yeah, right. Uh, it, it really is. It's a might, it, and get, keep the, the, the bad oils out of them. You know, those, those cheap, Poor quality oils are undermining the cell wall, and so you got energy leaking there. If you look at over time, you know the wild foods that were coming down to cultivated foods, and then the selection toward yields instead of nutrition, and the selection towards herbicide tolerance, selections toward everything but nutrition. And so now, you know, the chickens have come home to roost, and we're, we're paying this massive price. And if you read uh, Pottinger's book. Uh, what happens at three to four generations in, he was raising cats on these different diets, and by the third generation, their fur was falling apart, their bone structure. He couldn't even breed them by fourth, the fourth generation, but he put them on third generation cats back on a, a, a healthy diet, a raw milk, raw meat, <clears throat> and they slowly came back to health, but it took three generations to get back. <laughs> you know, these things, it takes you about as long to get out of the hole as it took to dig yourself in, um, but uh, but the point is that it sort of dropped off a cliff by the fourth generation, and I, it sure looks to me like we're like three to four generations in for, for really poor human nutrition. And, you know, the upside it's the control of the population that people don't seem to have it together on their own. Um, the downside is that we got so all these answers look really exciting to me, and then I start thinking, okay. This group of people is too old. This, pe this group of people is too young. This group of people is too sick. And there's a lot of categories of that, including malnourished, uh, et cetera. And then this group of people is too far in debt. Who's left? How, how are we going to you know, take whole continents and get them up to speed? You know, the soils, the, co the carbon, the, all the, the things that have to be done. So that's the conversation we need to have together because I don't have answers for that other than getting the soil healthy and getting really good food into people and waking them up energetically because they're gonna, I've watched it happen actually. Yeah. In the last 10 years, I've, I've seen that we did, and my dad's a social historian, so I've seen a lot of it in this room. It's a little challenging in the beginning, and now I think it's a lot of diversity. And what I've noticed about this community is that the Syrians and the vegans were really hardcore about animals and, and about animals. 
Mm -hmm. But a lot of them, I would say 75% or more, don't eat organic. Hmm. Eating vegan, fake meats and fake cheeses. And That's not going to go well. Yeah. Beyond Meat, which is this huge company that Tyson Chicken owns equity in, they made Nick Cathy invested $75 million. And he's a big environmentalist, but the organic piece the conversation isn't happening. So I feel like that community of the Kivas and some of these, yep. they're, they just have the passion to take action and to go speak out about you know something that's really destroying the planet and the wine culture. Um, and if we could fuel that community with this conversation, they'll get it. Yeah. Their yeah. They yeah. Went to a handful of vegans and they were all shocked because they were just eating vegan donuts and you know all these <laughs> vegan comfort foods. Huh. And, and they were like, "Wow, we had no idea about pesticides and or there was just like there's a around animals." There's so, some really important pieces in there, and <clears throat> I don't. I have to be careful about how I talk about it. I think I don't want to step on vegan toes. <laughs> But um, it's not animal agriculture. It's confined. It's the CAFO systems that should be absolutely uh, taken out, uh, boycotted. But if you look at broad scale reversal of desertification in Africa and all over the world, uh, there's no vegan option that I know of that, that touches it. I, the, the very best carbon sequestration I've ever seen is, I'm, I'll be there next week again, um, it's, it's almost shocking, but with 400 acres of land, I mean, I'm, I'd love to hear a vegan tell me, I mean, you can do, you can care for the animals, you don't have to eat them, but you've got to have animals in these systems to make, to make the ecologies work. Uh, Alan Savory, some of his work, and... Um, but the one I'm talking about is a, is a beef operation in Hillsborough, Ohio, on 400 acres of land with nothing but an electric fence and a herd of cows. He was able to raise uh, 400 acres of land by three percentage points uh, in four years. That's three quarters of a percentage point a year. Uh, you can't ignore that. I mean, the carbon, yeah, the organic matter. Um, that's, that's crazy. And if you had. Compared to CAFOs, absolutely, but I would still want to know which plants they're eating and where. I have to. I gotta go. Pla I gotta go plate by plate. I get you show me an actual plate where it came from, and I, I can talk about it. But to generalize that plants are better than animals is ridiculous. There's a really important conversation there, and it's, it's you got to really kind of. Bro I, I wrote, I got kind of angry about it, but there was an uh, an article came out, and I, and I like Jane Goodall, but she was like this this whole thing about how everybody should should be, go vegan, um, and I wrote back this the same uh, that that yes the CAFO is absolutely wrong, but that's like saying everybody should stop using electricity without considering solar or this just because of you know, nuclear and coal and whatnot. Uh, it, it makes no sense. We really have to restore these landscapes. And when you, when you look at like really large sections of, of grasslands that do not produce vegan foods, I mean, the, the, the soils aren't right, the slopes aren't right, um, animals do a phenomenal job if you know how to do it. And it takes a while to understand how to do it. But uh, it, it's really stunning when you see it working.
the opposite of why you're doing bone broth, yeah. Yeah, Here and then you. large scale? Well, the, the, the livestock operations I've seen, are, I, I did a bunch of calculations on some of the bedding packs in, in the dairies and things like that that I've been on, or uh, actually an interesting one, I'm not that much of an advocate for the, you know, medium to large scale poultry operations, but what happens in those operations, if you're just trying to make a not very good situation better, if you, what happens is that the ammonia levels go up, it triggers off a, a sensor and the vents open up and the fans kick on and then if it's 55 degrees or colder, the propane heaters go on. So if you put biochar in there, it, every pound of biochar will absorb uh, 20 cents worth of nitrogen or half a pound of nitrogen, keeping it from going into the air. And then it's usable nitrogen on farm in the charcoal matrix and it saves the electricity from, for the fans, it saves the, the propane for the heating. Um, it's, it's just really like a win-win-win. Um, now you can have a smaller version of that or a, a larger animal version that isn't messed up. <laughs> you know, grass-fed beef, actually most of the grass-fed beef operations are, or even like I just recently did a, a really nice 100% um, grass organic raw milk uh, cheese operation where none of the bulk milk left the farm. It was all being aged right there. And, um, you know, you could, there's lots of ways to do it. Uh, and there's a, almost an endless amount of ways to do bioremediation with it. Um, but you're saying, okay, so there's a lot of ways to charge it. If you want to look at uh, a friend of mine, Phil Blome has a TerraChar company, and he's got a charge, a page on there how to charge it. And you can just scale that up. Um, it's fairly straightforward stuff, you know, sea minerals and a lot of the stuff we're talking about in these protocols for BFA. Um, let's see, I have one, yeah. B-L-O-M, Terra Char is the company. Uh, yeah, he's doing good stuff. He'll be at Acres next week if you're going. Uh, no, he's in, uh, I think it's Springfield, Missouri. He's in Missouri. Sure. Well, they should use that to bust them. I mean, it's just like some of the, the toxic compounds in the chemical industry. You can, you know, you can tag molecular tag those, and then you find it in your well, then you get a lawsuit.
hmm, not right offhand, but I, I'm certain that it'll work. It's a matter of it's a matter of the volume. It, it actually gets interesting when you start combining it. Have you seen those uh, those socks or whatever they are, those yeah. geo sock things? Well, you could actually mix it with straw, inoculated straw with with mushrooms and biochar, because uh, they've done stuff with just inoculated mushroom uh, spawn that just <laughs> E. coli E. coli is coming off this way and then nothing on the other side. And you combine that with charcoal, and you could have something pretty powerful. So that you know, point source capture uh, treatment. So when you look at like the western basin of Lake Erie, uh, you go to every one of those farms where they got runoff and you could just literally stop dead zones with, with, with a handful of techniques. Um, Dr. John Todd has worked with stakeholders. So like Eco Machines, um, Dr. John Todd. John Todd. He's going to be at, uh, not very far from you, well, in North Carolina anyway, I'm going to probably go down there and I think it's March 8th at Living Web Farms. Really? Yeah. Which farm? That's, that's Asheville. Uh, Living Web. John? Uh, if you want John. an educational tour that is a film tale, like 20 or 30 minutes, you'll find it as interesting as someone who can kill right to harm in cold like this is. It's not enough fire remediation, but it will put people on the home hook. I, I misspoke. I don't can't say specifically stakeholders he's worked with, but large, large operations which similar. Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that. Yeah. Or no. the precedent. It's, it's so large that without precedent, you could go in and say, look, this is still working. He he does he does living machines. These biological aquatic biological systems that treat like, t you know. Uh, small town level sewage treatment systems and things like that. Not Films necessarily with biochar, but what's that? Films with the well, but John Todd is a living machine. Right. Yeah. Right. There's one in Rhinebeck, New York, and there's actually a school that he's built one in New Jersey, the Willow School. Oh, the city of Burlington, Vermont. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, that's kind of what we, I was saying about the lead in, in Cleveland. A guy from uh, OSU came up and he said, if with sufficient amounts of pre phosphorus present, the plant that you're growing will not, it'll be there, it won't take it up. So it, it has to do with uh, you know, why the plant isn't taking it up, potentially. Yeah. Yeah, there is. Saw that, yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah, yeah. And, and urine is an excellent way to charge biochar. In our workshop, we had a five gallon bucket urine on telling people to please pee, and it is amazing how much you can pee in this bucket and zero. Uh, Smells and, and so forth, but uh, easy easy way to do that. Doing it using biochar? Using urine. With biochar? I don't think it uses biochar. I don't think it uses biochar, just as a, as a fertilizer. Diluted, right. To your point about instead of leaving it into the sure. in public system or the septic system, it's got agricultural. There's all kinds of opportunities. And vindicated urine. Okay. Thank you. Biochar would be better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Brattleboro. Uh, there's two. Let me get to get in the back and then I'll get you. In, yeah, very good. Yeah, no, I think they're, it's a, it's a complex topic when you get into like which ones and what's in them and there's like not, a lot of non-agreement among the humic companies, but uh, Fulvic acid and humic acids are, are excellent in a mix. It is a charging um, system for biochar, if that's what you're asking. Yeah. Yeah, they're fascinating compounds. Uh, I will say one thing about the uh, phosphorus is that really the answer to global phosphorus, you know, peak phosphorus is mycorrhizal fungi. I mean, there are, there are you know, waste and things we can use around like you're saying, but um, it's like saying there's a nitrogen shortage when, <laughs> when the atmosphere is full of it. You know, there's a biological pathway for these things. Um, that's what we should be looking at. Uh, yeah. Um, 
Um, yeah, we had a few, I believe. We did three permaculture design courses in Cleveland over about a seven year period. Um, and I'm going to be visiting a, not an urban one, but a large one in Florida. I think it's at least 25 acres um, coming up that's connected to Living Web. In Florida, I want to say about a third of the way down on the east side, but not too far east. Uh, I'll, I'll know more if you want to get my contact. I, my contact information is on the BFA website for the Ohio chapter if anybody wants it, and feel free to get a hold of me. Yep. Um, would you clarify, it might have been you who had a conversation with, uh, there was this experiment of they had people with E. coli, had people washing their hands in regular soap and then an antibacterial soap and testing for the presence of E. coli still after, and they still had it after like 30 minutes of washing their hands in the soap, but then wash their hands Mm -hmm. and it was gone. Is that, do you know about that story? I believe it. Yeah. So that, that, that being true, that, that with capos, you know, you might want to look into that. Where was this place? Vermicomposting. Yeah, vermicomposting dealing with E. coli. Mm -hmm. I wish I knew the exact, I was hoping you were the one with the no. Yeah, that would go well again with with biochar, and I, I think that's one of the things in the Amazon in those terra preta soils is that there's supposed to be some monster earthworm down there that's involved in those soils <laughs> along with the, the carbon. Uh, so, can you explain how you use the biochar and how monster and what uh, I think it's like ten to thirty percent in a compost. I like it in compost. I've been I've been doing a base with. Um, uh, the paramagnetic rock powders, uh, rock powder compost, and um, and biochar as a as a base. You can then add other things depending on your soil test um, from there. But one another way you can use it if you have you do your soil test and you have a if you're putting trace uh, trace minerals in it, you can figure out up your area and then uh, dissolve your traces into water and then take a <coughs> take a bucket of biochar above the bucket of water with a pump and then run it through it and have it overflow back to the water and what you do you use a re, uh, electrical conductivity meter and you get a pretty high reading when you, initially but then as, the, as that's circulating through your your numbers are going down 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 to close to zero and then you know all your traces are now in the in the biochar and then you can spread that out over the area that you're um, that you're You've, you've calculated and then it's held in the biochar so it's not going to leach away in the first rain. Um, and then you can, or you could blend that into a larger amount of compost at that point and, you know, see what I'm saying. You have something? Thank you. It was a fair bit of repeat from last year, but you probably caught that. But yeah, this new stuff all the time. Thanks. So I guess I'm doing another version of this. I don't know how much different it's going to be, but it'll be shorter, of course, on Sunday. And I will be around and uh, oh, tomorrow for uh, the fireside chat if anybody wants to continue on something. Um, and then I'll have a table out here, maybe by this evening have some material. Thanks for coming. You guys, you guys really hung in there. <laughs>